still this is still part of your presentation marathon week right yes <laughs> we are, we are almost down. at the end of it yes as they say here in the uk wednesday is hump day so that means that you're on the hump and then you are going <laughs> towards the end so you're right in the middle with us so that is really great Okay, cool. So, Oana, you're going to do a little introduction, right? Sure, yes. I just want to um, tell mainly the jury because the, the students already know it and of course you, you already know it. Um, I just want to welcome everyone to uh, the third presentation in, in this um, MACAD uh, finals uh, presentation. So, as you know, MACAD is a Master for Advanced Computation in Architecture and Design and it is focused on teaching um, online the latest digital softwares um, and computation strategies for that are relevant, relevant for the AEC field today. Um, we have um, an amazing um, international faculty uh, team and we also have a group of very dedicated 23 students that are located and joining live from everywhere in the world. Um, and uh, this uh, round of presentations is part of the first module that is focused on environmental and structural analysis. So with this, I can let Mania give you um, a bit of the introduction of the brief, which I think she, she already, already did. <laughs> um, That's okay, I just repeat it, right? Um, so yes, actually for this class, we have been using uh, Caramba, which is a structural analysis plugin. And uh, students have been working in two parts uh, within this course. The first part was really kind of understanding the software, but also kind of principles of structural design through 2D analysis, 3D analysis, so kind of shell analysis, understanding how to make openings, where to allocate different materials, etc. And what they are going to present to you all today um, is a design that either they have designed for this course or a design that they have done for another class and how they have created a structural design for it. And they won't be only showing the final structural outcome, but actually show through the kind of variations and analysis they have done, how they understand and specifically kind of modified uh, particular parts of the structure in order to enhance um, uh, its performance. Um, so we have at the moment one amazing guest here uh, with us, which is Danai uh, Polivil. She works for uh, AKT2, so a structural engineer. Uh, she's based in London. And with Danai, uh, we used to teach together at the AA, the Architectural Association. She also teaches at UCL. Um, and it's obviously great to have her feedback today. Um, around one hour in, uh, we will also be joined by Adrian Campbell, um, who is uh, used to work for Arab and now has uh, his own company, Change Building. He has been with us. He has a very uh, interesting link between structural design and sustainability. So he will give us his comments on that. And then two hours in, <laughs> roughly, we will be joined as well by Nina Tabing, um, who is um, also a dear friend and she works for Arab and she has worked on the London Aquatic Center and knows everything about uh, buildings, let's say that kind of transform or change over time. So that building specifically, so the swimming pool for the London Olympics has a kind of permanent state and a kind of temporary state. So the Olympics kind of state and uh, for the rest of its life. So I think that is also very uh, great to have her feedback on this. So I think we can start. So what we will do is um, as we kind of planned, we will have first three groups of students present um, after one another. And then we will have around, let's say, 20, 25 minutes um, discussion with the critics. I have to say that I forgot that Raymond Cranmuller from IAC will also join, who should be here, uh, but hasn't, uh, hasn't arrived yet. I have messaged him. Uh, so hopefully he will be joining soon. Sorry, so with Raymond, I have been running uh, my data informed structures class for the past three, four years. Um, so he knows everything about structural design, but he is um, an excellent 
a designer in kind of fabrication and we do uh, one to one scale kind of design pavilions together. So yeah, that's it. Are we ready? Yay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, okay, so the lineup. Uh, sorry? Yeah, should group number five start now? Yeah, so we have group five, group seven, and then uh, group one. So I understood that you have been instructed to try to present for seven minutes. So I will use the timer. Um, so, and I will just let it ring at seven minutes and then you just finish, right? And then we continue uh, to the next uh, group. Super, go for it. Ready, Hisham? Yeah, just loading here, yeah. Okay, cool. I almost put my timer for seven hours instead. <laughs> okay, good, good, yeah. We can talk for seven hours, yeah. Okay, so hi everyone, we are group number five. And basically we are doing the structure analysis from one of the projects to, to yeah, structure and optimization uh, seminar. And we are following the staggered floor theme. Uh, so first, uh, yeah, we looked at the many reference projects where first they can use uh, uh, yeah, just a combination of, of timber blocks to have a better structure performance. And then again, another project where they use uh, shifted floors and columns to have the structure working as a whole, not like each element working alone. And then uh, we looked also at two projects where they use timber blocks where, where they are organized together to have stacked elements and to create the building structure from that for with that sense so and yeah so again we are following the staggered floors uh theme and basically this is an image just to show what is a staggered floor system uh inside buildings so in, in the next slide we are showing our design intention so we have our site inside uh, krakow poland and we are creating residential building so first we have uh, the massing is environmentally optimized based on daylighting analysis. And then we have different massing options to test uh, staggered floors structures. Um, and that slide, we can see our environmental analysis, just uh, I'm going to go through it. So we, uh, yeah, we have many actions was based on maximizing daylighting inside buildings. So we have adding courtyard and Everything that shifted to yeah to create like to have more ASD factor inside the building. Uh, and in the next slide, we started to look at what is the difference between the typical MOM frame and when we are creating shifted uh, sh shifted floors and shifted floors in two uh, variations to have a better structure performance. And we can see in the first variation as floors are shifting by half of story heights. And in third option, we have uh, shifting by the third of the floor height. Uh, so to understand what is the difference between a uh, typical moment frame and the staggered one and why it, it performed better, we were looking for uh, the actual forces and bending moments and displacement. And here we can see that how displacement and bending moments are getting lower after using shifted uh, floor systems. And we can have also lower maximum utilization and mean utilization. And basically, uh, this is based on how forces are distributed inside floors to columns and then another floor. And we can see in the stack floors, we have like many uh, elements working <laughs> together instead of the typical, uh, the typical system. So for the conclusion, we are going to use uh, the shifted floors for the rest of the presentation. And basically, it performed better to structural performance. And again, we can have more interesting architectural spaces, creating outdoors for people, and and create interesting interior spaces within the structure. Um, so first, we created uh, four modules for our apartments. We have uh, basically modules 3.5 by 3.5 meters, and it it duplicates in both directions width, length, and height. And then for the building, we have 
uh, two directions, X and Y direction. And basically we decided to have two different uh, designs for the X and Y direction to have better performance uh, versus uh, wind coming from both directions. So for the X direction, we have the, the staggered floor system uh, as a previous one. And in Y direction, we have a, uh, another uh, staggered floor system and both is going to perform perpendicularly to different load directions. And from that, uh, Flippy can, can go on. Yeah, so then after all that analysis, we took like different strips of the 3D model and then basically we define uh, three different uh, geometries. So we have a base geometry where we basically, we don't have any kind of opening or shifting around. And then after that, we start looking at two different variations where we uh, introduce different type of openings and we start moving like units on different directions. So for the load cases, we are always testing the, the stripes in two, with two load cases with, uh, in set direction, which is gravity and then wind coming from the wide uh, direction. So then the, our initial analysis was, uh, well, our initial idea was to test the base geometry and see how that was performing in terms of the structural point of view. And then up after that, we basically, we compared that scenario against like the two variations. So for the first variation, uh, we basically we identify like some of the areas that the floors are using are being used more and in for the displacement displacement and we get a maximum of displacement for six centimeters on this option if you compare with the with the base case then for the second the same same first variation but with the wind uh, coming from y direction so basically, as you can see in the diagrams, like part of the building is going beyond the, the threshold. So after that, with that, we were able to inform like our further decisions and how exactly the, let's say, for example, all the, the um, elevations and the openings could work. So then for the second variation, so we start adding like big openings and we, again, we start having like floors that are working uh, harder and particularly like when we have those openings and we are trying to connect them. Um, same for the displacement. So we're getting values for seven centimeters for displacement or the whole strips. And then same for the wind direction. So as you can see in the diagram, uh, you see where the, it's, it's, a, it's quite clear where the tension and the compression is coming from and, and how the structure is trying to perform. So the third uh, strip was kind of like a testing where we want to try to inform the decision of where the openings for the windows should be. And again, we start looking at two different load cases. Uh, we had gravity, is that seven minutes already? Um, so it's okay, I'm going to put three more. Let's try to do 10 okay. minutes. Okay, That's so it. I will basically just go a little bit quickly. So we did the same analysis and based on that, we start having like the different openings and, and, and we try to inform that decision. So now we'll pass it to Alexandra that is going to explain the sections. And... Yeah, um, so then we we'll try to look at the whole 3D model. Um, so maybe Felipe, you can go ahead because my remote control does not work. So next we look at the whole model and then we compare the results for the Load case one, so gravity, wind in both directions. And then uh, we start looking at utilization for uh, for the whole building and then uh, separately for walls and floors. So the, and the utilization for wall um, for gravity, then wind X um, for walls and floors, and then for wind in Y, dire uh, in y direction. Uh, for the next slide, floors. And then, um, on the other slide, we'll look at the displacement of the whole um, for 3D model. Uh, so we see that we have a lot of displacement in the wind in X direction, but we don't have much displacement for gravity and wind. And then, then the next scenario would be when we introduce the culture to introduce the daylight from environmental analysis. 
And so then we compare this to the base model. We see that uh, utilization for each of the load cases. And on the next slide, we'll see the comparison to the base model. So basically for gravity, we didn't have much change for gravity. For wind X, we have a bit lower displacement that we, but for wind X, we'll look at wind X further in the presentation. And for wind Y, we see that the biggest change is in the area that we have the courtyard. And also the displacement for wind X is the biggest looking at the comparison. The next variation, we are looking at the uh, geometry with open spaces at the bottom because we wanted to introduce some open spaces architecturally. And in this case, uh, we could see that we had a bit uh, also bigger um, utilization for wind X and wind, uh, and wind Y. And then looking at the diagrams, we are not really understanding how the force distribution is taking place in the shell element. So this is why we trace the um, shell for shell elements with beams, and we introduced columns and floor beams instead of shell elements to kind of see do the study of the distribution of the um, of the forces. So then you can in the next slide you can see how the actual force and uh, actual force distributes in the columns and in the beam, floor beams. And then we compare it to the version on the next slide. Um, we do the section through it and we show how, um, what is the force distribution in the section one in the next slide. And so we look at how the uh, actual forces are distributing uh, for the wind in direction X. And then on the next slide, we'll see how um, we introduce the courtyard and then we do the same study. So we, uh, we look at columns and floor beams separately, and then we see what's changed inside. So in the next slide, we'll see that, the, um, that what is actually changing is the area in, around the courtyard. So um, we'll look at the, those three sections. So what we observed is that because we introduced the hole in the middle of the building, the section, in, the section one doesn't have anything in between. So the forces has to distribute Around the around the opening, and this is why we have bigger floor beam actual forces in section two, and then in section three, the um, the column uh, column forces are bigger than in section two, but uh, floor beam um, from beams are uh, not as high. So just to sum up, we we look at um, the again at the shell forces in the in the um, shell forces values in the shell model. And then just to sum up that gravity forces are not changing that much when you introduce the courtyard, but wind forces are actually, um, tension and compression is actually higher, but bending moments are a bit lower. And then for wind Y, the part that is working the highest is the part when we have the courtyard. And it's all working three times higher, more or less. And then yeah, the we, are all, we are almost done. You are just showing the final model coming from that whole analysis and yeah, with the staggered floors and like finally we have a section shows relationships inside the building where we can use uh, clean elements and finally render one render or two render shots showing the whole structure. And thank you. Sorry for taking longer time. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <coughs> Amazing. Amazing. And I know it is a marathon and speaking very quickly, but it was really good. So don't worry. We just because it's also important that we can be tell us all the, the great stuff you have done. So I think it's really cool. And so all building in timber. So that's very exciting. Yeah. <laughs> great, okay. Yeah, so we will do all the three projects after one another and then we, we will make comments. Great, okay, so let's continue with group seven. And I put it again, seven minutes, huh? just in case you manage the time frame. So we are going to start our final presentation um, for the Public Culture Center in Madrid. So the site is, is located in the, um, in the city center of Madrid. And then this is the, um, uh, our process, optimization process to form, for uh, form finding with the several rows, in, as we can see on the screen. And then 21 is the, is the mass we chose uh, for our form. 
which is which is uh, satis which satisfy um, all of our roles. And then our uh, structural intention was to, to, to test the stability by making cantilevers with slabs of rotation and how does having um, a core elements affects the structure and having a least amount of columns for you know, interior sur surface for users. So this is the, our FASA system. We have a three kinds of, of panels for openings and extruded, the extruded panel for plants and uh, closed panel based on the, um, our, um, our analysis uh, of sun radiation and noise sounds, uh, reflections, and, and then privacy uh, as a program. So this is the image, final image of our facade. So we have uh, two different messes. So our first study was to to understand to with our intention, uh, we try to to manually understand how how our how the structure um, could be. And so our, our intention was to test the stability by making cantilevers with a slab rotation, and then the, and then to achieve these goals um, in the Building A, we have a core, concrete core uh, with thrust system. And, and then building B, we have we don't have any core because this is small building, um, but we have a thrust structure in outside. So this is the first, our first analysis, analysis with the utilization displacement. Um, the mass is quite low because of thanks to the um, very, um, basic um, structure and also displacement was also stable. Utilization is also perfect. And for building B was also same as we don't have any, we don't found any big problem for um, structure issues. And now we tested second study to, to not giving a uh, columns. As you can see here, we, have, we, really have a, we had a lot of columns inside. So we tried to do not having a column, and then we tested for our um, outer structure. Uh, and Heine? Yeah, so as we said, one of our structure objectives uh, was to have as much of free space and flexible interior space as possible. Uh, that's why our second study uh, was to test uh, having only an outer structural grid, how that would work. First, uh, oh. Um, yeah, first we tried with a quad grid, uh, but we had a big utilization. And also that we saw that uh, mass was increased uh, so much and the stresses were mainly concentrated um, over the area of the cantilever. Um, then we tried with a triangular grid where we saw a better material distribution, but still uh, we had quite big uh, utilization. Uh, yeah, and also the stresses uh, because of the material distribution, we saw that uh, it was uh, working more generally better. Um, yeah, but then we saw that we needed uh, some columns on the inside uh, and that with just the outer grid wasn't enough. Um, so we introduced uh, some columns on it, um, which uh, we saw that were absorbing much of the stresses of compression uh, of the overall structure, uh, also with the core. Uh, yeah, so through the mass opening analysis, we got very stable outer structure that uh, allows us to minimize the columns inside. In addition, we offer more space for users because we have with uh, that rather that we in the inner principal structure because we have just a few columns inside. Uh, but also we understood where bending moments uh, were localized um, on the structure. Uh, however, we got uh, much more material to withstand the building uh, rather than with the inner structure. And of course, we gained in stability because of that. 
So uh, um, also the grid uh, that we studied, we weren't matching the final facade that we had. So uh, based on the environmental and user algorithmic data, and neither it followed a structural force flow path. Therefore, uh, after these previous studies, uh, our question was how to combine uh, the result of facade and structural design. So to combine these two things, we used uh, our facade triangulation, the one that we designed uh, through algorithmic data, uh, which has also some a bit more of uh, structural logic. And we got quite good results. Uh, you can see that displacement is quite good. Utilization is OK. Uh, here we were using a, a 10 per 10 centimeter fine good cross section for the overall mm -hmm. facade. Um, but we saw that we had very little mean utilization values for the facade and that uh, material distribution was localized in very certain areas. So that's why we decided to optimize the cross section uh, of the facade grid, depending on the utilization and the stresses. And we have beams that go uh, between five to 15 centimeter. And now we got uh, better mean values uh, of utilization Again, uh, we tested uh, the building A with a core, a concrete core, and uh, then the other structure is a uh, fine wood. So uh, we were able to have just uh, two columns uh, on building B and then the outer structure. Then, um, yeah, so uh, we also saw that with this grid, uh, which follow a more structural force flow path to the ground. We reduce mass uh, quite a lot uh, compared to our first uh, grid studies. And we also uh, had uh, fewer columns and a very stable uh, structure. Yeah. So, um... We did little carbon um, studies. So this is our building A and B. Uh, we have uh, like about 180 tons of, of um, CO2 emissions. Um, we try to use minimized, minimized concrete um, because of in, in terms of um, CO2 emission. Um, so we have, we use two kinds of different woods, Glarium and CLT. So we have huge amount of CRT because of um, slab. So our building structure carbon emission um, normally um, have a huge percentage of um, construction and transport, we assume. And um, well, how to, to, to reduce the CO2 emission probably can use um, prefabricate concrete instead of using precast concrete, although very, very little amount of concrete we have. But also we think about that we don't have uh, concrete uh, in building B, therefore we can, um, when we, um, um, how can I say, deconstruct, deconstruct the building, we don't, we don't, we can reuse the woods later. Uh, we expect also uh, the re replacing the wood structure in future so that we, the lifespan of the building can be uh, prolong, 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 uh, can be longer than normal buildings. So this is the um, not really construction process, but we separated by uh, different materials. As you can see here, we saw the wood structure mm. and outer structure. Thank you. Amazing, guys. Thank you. And it's so nice to smell all the, the three different studies that you have done. And I think what is really nice, because I asked all of you not to just present the end, 
that we really see what is happening and where you can benefit, let's say, from different uh, types of structural kind of design and how what can inform and actually what works better and what doesn't. So I think that is really, yeah, it's really great. So thanks so much for that. Let me do the final group, group one. Can you see the screen? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so this is a project titled Modular Edifice, and uh, we are group one with myself, Keshav, uh, Krishna, and Alex. So our project, we have divided the presentation to four parts. So the first is site. So site is located in Mumbai, India. It is located on the eastern coast of Mumbai. So we chose to do a co-working space as a program of our building. Uh, so then we formulate different programmatic requirements like uh, open desk, shared pods, private uh, meeting rooms, conference room, and a library. So we chose the octahedron completely in timber because of uh, no wastage of space during the interlocking and also the stability possibilities that are offered by the octahedron. So then we went, uh, divided the module into three types, small, medium, and large, depending on the sizes required for the each function that we had described earlier. Then we had a set, um, so this is just a view showing uh, the, uh, the composition. So uh, then we had a separate uh, overall form finding process, which minimizes radiation, increases volume, which is optimized by using Wallace. So then we chose this iteration because it performs the best uh, and it was, and because of aesthetic reasons as well. So then uh, we resorted to uh, aggregate the modules that we had obtained earlier in the environmentally optimized uh, in the environmentally optimized form as shown in the red here. So this was the final shell we took forward for the structural analysis. So then we decided to analyze two forms of a building. One is a timber shell and other is a timber grid. And for in this analysis, we subject it to wind load and dead load only. So the first one is a timber shell, which is about 50 mm thick. The mass, the mass was around some 400,000 kg. So the displacement was obviously only in the top of the form. And uh, the utilization analysis so that showed that the utilization was maximum only at the taller end of the building due to the wind load which are pushing. Uh, the second setup had uh, um, 20 centimeter thick uh, timber sections. So the mass, uh, the mass was around 11,000 kg, which was uh, uh, sorry, 110,000 kg, which was uh, which is more than the timber shell. However, the displacement and the utilization seemed to be much higher than that of the timber shell. Um, then uh, we understood that the timber shell is actually working much better than the grid uh, because uh, because the utilization was far lesser and the mass was also far lesser. But however, we chose to go ahead with the grid because of uh, programmatic reasons. So then we wanted to club, club together modules like this, like having three space uh, as shown in this module. So we went back to 2D analysis to help us understand how we can uh, cluster uh, modules to understand the structure better. So then uh, we took the north-south section of our building and applied wind, gravity, and floor loading to this section. So wind was applied mm -hmm. from the north, which is the predominant direction uh, in the side of wind in the side. So setup one basically shows the basic setup with all the structural members, uh, just to understand uh, the geometric stability of the section. And section two shows the the the, feed, the, the spaces that were carved out because of the structural feedback. So setup one basically has a mass of around 33,000 kg. So then uh, uh, the MX and NY analysis uh, shows that the members that were deforming the most were in this end. And these were the members that we chose to retain for our structural integrity. So the mean displacement was around 0. 0.0, like was around three centimeters. And the mean utilization was very less, which shows the structure was very stable because of triangulation. Uh, so the green shows the members that were uh, most displaced. And so we tried to remove these, uh, so remove members which were least displaced and uh, least utilized. So based on the feedback from the, so from the program, as well as the structural analysis, we decided to retain uh, parts that were mostly deforming and try to form large spaces inside, which can form like the conference room and like the office areas. So this setup has a mass of about 21,000 kilograms. So the large open plates are supposed to meant to have larger programs. 
So the bending moments are of course higher on the horizontal slabs and the mean utilization has also uh, uh, considerably increased to 25% and most of the utilization is uh, under 100% which shows this structure is uh, more or less stable. So then uh, we went to final structural analysis which Alex can explain. Yeah, so then we went on and uh, took uh, the final aggregation of the bigger modules and prepared a setup for the present uh, for the simulation. So next slide, please. Uh, here is the each part of our simulation, which is the ground floors, the main floor, the main floors, the atrium, the floors, and the overall grid of the building. So let's go next. Yeah, then we uh, we took extra caution and prepared the detailed uh, result cases for the for our whole mass. So we analyzed uh, the wind from two predominant directions, north and west, and also analyzed the floor loads for each case. Then we again went on and to better analyze how the building behaves, we analyzed uh, the, the building with two approaches. One was the shell, shell model and the second one was the beam model. Uh, the first simulation we did was uh, the, the shell model, sorry for the misspelling on the slide, uh, where we uh, where we analyze just the shell model without water uh, floors. Uh, let's go next, please. Uh, then we uh, tried to analyze how the force flows through our building using the first row lines. Let's go next. And then we went on to further analyze uh, the shell uh, not the shell, the beams, the, the beam model. And as we, uh, developed, as we discovered earlier, the beam model was uh, much heavier than the shell model while behaving uh, uh, a little worse. But the usage of the beam model allowed us for the bigger openings and allowed us to uh, actually reduce the displacement uh, of our building. Let's go next, please. Uh, so then we further add uh, the floors to our simulation to make it more viable, which forced us to increase the beam sections and the overall mass of the building. Uh, let's go next. Then we, we are thinking about how to actually re, uh, extract the data and how to extract the parts of this such complex building and uh, figure out which needs to be reinforced to maintain the integrity and stability of our building, uh, which we found. Uh, yeah, and... Uh, yeah, then we move ahead with... Uh integrating the function into this uh, grid model. And uh, based on the clustering that Keshwa explained before, we uh, uh, kept, the, um, uh, kept the modules that are uh, having the members uh, with maximum utilization as we found before as structural members. And then we uh, cluster the other modules as function, uh, functional modules with interior members rem removed. So these are, this is the comparison between a module with interior members and the clustered, mo uh, clustered form. And what we found out is mass is significantly reduced about 15%. And uh, as expected, the maximum displacement is slightly on a higher range, but uh, the mean displacement uh, still remains almost the same. Next slide. And uh, yeah, and then uh, this, uh, we observe the comparison. Uh, we compare the utilization of the two, and we found out that this the same. It's the same case where the minimum and maximum utilization is very large for the clustered module, but uh, when we compare the mean utilization, it uh, it is still on a similar scale. Next slide.
and then we uh, uh, and did a bending moment analysis of a 3D model. And this gave a similar result to that of the sectional analysis, where the inclined facade modules show the maximum bending moments. But uh, uh, since the introduction of this atrium, uh, this, uh, instead of just one facade, the whole modules were showing bending larger than the rest of the building. And next slide. And this was uh, the, the same was the case of uh, the axial forces flowing through the building where the compressive forces are uh, higher for this uh, slant inclined facade and then the tensile, uh, the flows, uh, floor or the horizontal members have the highest, supporting this has the highest tensile force, but this, this seemed like uh, there is a disconnection between this uh, large inclined modules and the rest of the building. So next slide. Uh, so we. So that was already ten minutes, huh? Yeah. So we we concluding. So uh, we introduced a steel core into the atrium. Yeah, we introduced this uh, and uh, to to how uh, We introduced the steel core in the middle uh, in order to uh, make the building more rigid, and also it allowed us with to. Uh, to decrease the overall mass of the building and the beam sections of the timber frames uh, significantly from 13 centimeters to 24 centimeters while not uh, decreasing, uh, no, but not by not increasing the overall mass. Yeah, let's go for this quick visualization and finish. So, I mean, these are just the renders to just give a feel of the building. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Oh, that went super quick. Uh, thank you guys. So also really well done. And I think it would be good uh, to have maybe later a little discussion on what is really the impact, you know, of having this additional steel structure. So they're kind of blowing some leaves here. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to give the word to Danai. Are you ready, Danai, to give some comments to this amazing work just presented by these three groups? Yeah, sure. Uh, well done, first of all, to all the groups. Very nice work and very nice studies. I really like the comparison between the uh, several variations on your uh, projects. And I have to say that, I mean, most of these decisions that we usually do, the structural decisions are usually affected by the aesthetics uh, as well as the client decisions uh, or the needs. So you are very lucky that you didn't have to deal uh, with these constraints <laughs> in your project. So you had the flexibility to basically, um, yeah, investigate several options without, without having to limit uh, uh, the things uh, that uh, you are exploring. Um, uh, a comment that I have is that uh, usually it helps when you do a comparison between several variations to compare the numbers that you get, uh, for example, the displacement or uh, the mass uh, that you have mentioned with a building that is already built, mm -hmm. like, uh, for example, the Eiffel Tower or the Shard or like a well-known building uh, in order to uh, understand where you are. So is the mass that you have or is the displacement that you have too much or is it too less or is okay for the building uh, that you're trying to optimize? Uh, because for example, uh, in some projects you have mentioned uh, six centimeters of, defle of deflection and in some others you have mentioned 25 centimeters, which of course is a very big uh, uh, difference. And if you think about it, 25 centimeters is like, I think it's quite a lot uh, for a building. But maybe if you compare it with, uh, I don't know, with another building, if you're designing a tower, maybe then it's not that bad. Uh, so yeah, it usually helps if um, you set out your uh, performance criteria or maybe the aesthetics uh, that you're trying to achieve. Um, so that's one of the comments. Uh, the other comment is that um, it also helps to think about the member sizes because of course the mass uh, is related with the member sizes. So uh, for example, are the CLT panels that you're using 250 millimeters thick, which is like a standard uh, thickness to use or is 500? Um, because this helps to understand if 
um, if the parameters that you're using are realistic compared to also the results uh, that we get. Um, I mean, I understand that uh, <laughs> that's like not the main goal, it's just like thoughts for, uh, for the future. Uh, the other thing uh, that uh, becomes important is when you start thinking about the connections. So how do all of these elements uh, come together? Um, uh, because this also has uh, an influence on uh, the sizes uh, of the elements uh, as well as uh, the performance. Uh, as well as the fabrication process. So the size of the elements that you can bring on site, uh, if it's gonna be, uh, if the, like, the assembly is gonna be off site or on site uh, and so on. Um, also something else that I haven't uh, understand was uh, what are the, um, the releases? So what are the, um, the, uh, the joint uh, <laughs> uh, parameters? Uh, Manya is laughing. <laughs> Uh, that's a very engineering uh, comment, I guess. Uh, so what are the joint parameters between uh, your elements? Uh, are they uh, fixed uh, or are they pinned? So this makes a difference as well on, um, on the results. Um, and um, another comment that I guess goes together with the member sizes is that uh, depending on uh, the size of the members and also the deflection, the displacement that you allow, this will have an implication on the headroom on your space. So it's something that becomes quite important uh, when discussing with, uh, with the design uh, team. So it can also be um, a constraint uh, on your project. Um, yeah, that's what I have for now. <laughs> super diehard kind of comments than I, because indeed, because obviously you have to imagine that these guys, they just started seven weeks ago, really thinking about structural concepts. So actually I think what is really great is that the level of comments that you are given is also based because actually they're really presenting in my opinion, really good um, and thorough kind of work and understanding of what has certain impacts on the on the building design. So I think that that is really good. And obviously, we just used, you know, let's say height over 500 for maximum displacement. So but I really like that, for example, what you are mentioning to have a kind of benchmark um, yeah, let's say kind of design that you can compare kind of thicknesses with uh, that I think is really good. And obviously we have done that a little bit more as a kind of base model kind of that is like their own design and then making variations and really seeing what what the impacts are, uh, what the impacts are there. Um, so maybe uh, I will then use this opportunity, unless, Hannah, do you have any specific questions that you want to ask them? Uh, I would just say good work, everyone. It's very Ooh. impressive for, for the time that we have had, so congratulations. <laughs> Yeah, really super good, really super good. So I will try to give a super quick comment like on each of the of the groups, maybe something again more that, uh, yeah, just kind of talks about the kind of philosophy of the, of the project. So for the first team, so group five, um, I'm wondering, so because like you started with the whole block and then you carved out the center and um, I wonder if you would go back to redesign, let's say, kind of the internal walls because you're using shear walls together with staggered floors in the opposite direction. And, you know, if you think that it was would be important to have one more feedback loop, again, understanding the relationship, let's say, between um, the internal core and again the kind of floor staggering and the kind of shear wall kind of principles because maybe like yeah it's quite different let's say from uh, starting with the kind of solid so what do you think that it is important to have another kind of uh, yeah kind of uh, evaluation of how you would make openings let's say in the in the shear walls Openings or just the courtyard inside the middle of the building? Yeah, because I think that the, the courtyard has an impact on where the where you would place the openings. 
And now the openings are placed based on having not like a big gap, let's say in the middle. So I wonder like if it would be wise, obviously I'm already <laughs> here, uh, but I think that would be good to think about because obviously we kind of sometimes, and I think this is important for all of us to remember, sometimes we isolate parts and we just look at the shear wall. But now, because there's a big gap, let's say, a, an, an atrium behind it, actually, maybe then we have to think again that maybe we should use the 3D model to inform uh, the opening locations in the shear wall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because we are seeing that the walls on the edges and uh, like the, the, we have walls that are working more because of this creating this atrium. So we will have to go back and evaluate if we can place the same number of openings that we had before. And also, yeah, as you mentioned- add, Maybe we can have like a, another organization of, of staggered floors. Yeah, so exactly. Like Our next yeah. step was to create different um, orientation or like different um, the layout of the staggered floors, but we haven't had time to test it, but this was our next step, so exactly. Great, because I think what is super exciting is that you have the two stability systems like completely different in uh, in architectural language and in structural behavior, right? In the two directions, which I think is really exciting. And yes, really what I wanted to mention is more that, yeah, we should not just think because they tell you, yeah, do 2D analysis, that a 2D analysis is always good because sometimes we need a 3D analysis to actually tell us more, for example, if we have the have the atrium there. But uh, yes, also really great work and really super clear presentation. So really uh, amazingly well done. And then Thank you. For, Thank you. For, yeah, uh, for group seven. So um, let's say that if I am now uh, the architect, what type of truss system or which structure would you recommend? So you have created, let's say, a super dense external kind of grid. You had more like a truss, like the initial kind of structure, let's say with the columns, and one that is more optimized. Which one would you suggest me to go for and why? Well, I think that... Uh the facade grid that we had was based on the design uh, that we did for our studio. Mm -hmm. um, but the first trust that we uh, researched on uh, really worked pretty well and it had uh, less mass than uh, the one with the facade, the facade grid. So I think uh, maybe in terms of cost, in terms of uh, mass, materials, and so on, it will be better to have uh, yeah, this kind of truss, which is located only on the parts uh, which are receiving more uh, stresses and more, yeah, with the cantilevers and so on. I think it depends on the client, like, yeah. if, he, if you or she is really like cost. Think about only cost. I prefer it in like first print, like very, very basic uh, structure. But I actually, if we if he wants to have your design in different, in, actually in our um, architectural development, clients funds can choose how many how many percentage of openings they can have because we have a private area and public area space. So they can ch change the value of uh, percentage of opening so that's why we chose um triangle panels because if we change the facade and also the structures also can be very adaptable for the changing of the facade so i think we can have some kind of negotiation because we actually we the, our structure study has triangle structure everywhere but um where we don't need the uh, windows. We, we can have a concrete concrete walls or sure walls stuff, so we can econom economize the, wall, the cost of construction structure. I mean, so. yeah, that would be also a possibility. Like in the parts where we don't have in the corner, we don't need uh, reassemble a little a little bit the grid uh, to have less material with the force flow uh, analysis that we saw. Mm. 
Yeah, because I think actually really great what you guys are discussing, because sometimes now we have this kind of almost black and white solutions. Either it is like a mega grid or it is something very dense or it is something kind of more linked to the force flow, but then with kind of reduced size elements. And I think it's really good to think about hybrids, but also be reminded that even if I would have like a mega frame, you would still need structure to mount your facade. So maybe when you are going for a denser grid, you know, actually it's already great because then you don't need to put an extra substructure in. So obviously that is why sometimes, and this is also what the Nye was mentioning before, it is not so black and white, right? So it's not like, yeah, the best optimized structure. Well, actually there still needs to be a facade. You need to think about let's say flexibility, as you are talking about, some areas don't need to be as flexible. Um, so I think that that is really, it is really good. So it's again, important to be reminded that although sometimes our analysis says, yeah, cool, actually this one is better or this one is actually not as good, that maybe it is better because it already allows for the facade elements to be connected or because um, you know the forces are less, the connections will be much easier and you don't need to use a crane or you can prefabricate. So like this is kind of difficult obviously, but I think it's important that all the time when we are looking at an analysis that we try to think about it um, yeah, holistically. But also really great job. I would like to know how much material you have managed to reduce, um, you know, with the kind of uh, optimizing of the cross section. How much is it roughly in percentage? Uh, like 20,000 uh, kilograms it was in the big mass. So how much is that percentage wise you think? Uh, I don't, I or you, you can you can you can work it out quickly and tell it to us later because I think this is really quite interesting because obviously I have asked all of you not only to just use an optimizer right because actually it is really important to always consider different strategies i.e. do I have a big grid do I have a small grid does it link to my force flow and then we can still use um, you know also the other means to uh, to reduce the cross section, so that's great. I see. About 10%, I think. Say again. Ten percent. Ten percent. So that's really great. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, yeah, I see that Adrian has also joined. Hi, Adrian. We are still going through the the last group, so I will just make a super quick uh, comment as well to group one, and then we will continue with the next uh, three. Um, so yeah, for group one, also uh, super great work. And I think like, so maybe similar uh, to group seven, because I wonder, um, would you sell me a hybrid? If you would sell me a hybrid between using, let's say kind of shell like elements, so CLT plates versus timber elements, where would they be positioned and why? Or would you sell me a hybrid between, let's say, a timber uh, grid structure and a steel internal frame? So which one would you go for? I think we'll go for the second one, especially because uh, maybe we didn't stress this enough during our presentation, but uh, one of our main goals was to use uh, this, the same length of material to to make the work on site extremely fast and easy. Yeah, so this the, the approach with uh, the the last one, the grid and still still core in the middle, it's not still the core, but still, uh, yeah, I'd say still core in the middle was the most, uh, the most, the best, just the best solution for what we analyzed. Yeah both in terms of the overall mass and both, like, as you mentioned, like how much percentage, for example, the guys uh, in the group seven, how much percentage they gained, like they gained 10% and we managed to also to gain uh, around, I think, the, the decrease from the 30 centimeters by 30 centimeters uh, timber beam to 24 by 24, which is uh, quite a lot of uh, subtraction of material overall save in CO2 emission, uh, CO2 
footprint. And then obviously you have then to repay, let's say with the steel structure, yeah. but to think again, tapping onto a point that then I mentioned, if you have, like for example, then when you have a steel core, because you have such a cantilever, actually maybe with the steel core, your construction will be much easier as well because everything will be tied back. So I think also again, like similar to the previous group, like think about the holistic kind of discussion as well when we are suggesting this. Um, and I think also it is good to, to consider uh, hybrids, obviously. Um, yeah, so I think it, was, it is really, uh, really great. And um, I'm just a little bit wondering about the 2D uh, kind of uh, like say triangulated grid. And then obviously all of a sudden with like mega holes in it, I am not really sure how that is really informed uh, where the openings are, um, but uh, you can tell me that when you guys are submitting uh, the kind of final documentation. Yeah. Amazing. So again, really well done uh, to all three groups. Um, we just saw that Raymond has also joined us. Hi, Raymond. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm and so sorry. I had some uh, really weird technical issues here, and uh, I but I was able to move some things around, so at least now I can stay until the end. That's great. That's great. And Adrian also is here, and Danai. Raymond, hey. Oh, Danai, hey, how are you? <laughs> Hello, I'm good. Nice to see you. Long, long time no see. <laughs> exactly. And good morning, everybody else. I With, see him. Uh, yeah, go for it. In the background of Alexander, I see like some familiar geometry. Oh, you mean this vase? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> It's a bit of an ins inside joke, but anyway. All right. I'm very curious to see your, to see your projects. How much did I miss? Uh, three amazing groups. I can't believe it, but I'm sure uh, you can revisit the recordings. Uh, and it was really great. So thank you. We try to present in seven minutes, but it will be more <laughs> than uh, 10 minutes. And then we will have around, let's say, 20, 25 minutes discussion uh, with all of us. Obviously, now I spoke a lot, um, but I will, in the next session, uh, give Danai, Raymond, and Adrian um, the floor. So we have group two, group eight, and group three uh, to go next. Um, I will put again the timer. And uh, um, yes, and I think then also after this kind of our session, we will just have a kind of five minute break so we can have something to drink, and use the facilities, etc. Obviously, for the students that already have presented, please, you know, feel free, but this is more uh, also for us and uh, uh, for the critics so that we can have like a mini pause. Okay, great. So group two, are you ready? Yep. Yeah. Super, I'm going to put the um, timer at seven again. Um, hi everyone, we are group two, Marisa, Amar and Pedro. Next. Uh, this is our goal. Uh, how could we have the, the least uh, amount of columns and maximize the floor space while keeping in mind uh, our team of on-site, off-site plugin? Next, yeah. Um, exploring the, the, the boundaries about, uh, of this topic, we start to think about the program and how the structure could respond to it. So we come with a library uh, a hole that could um, uh, receive different kind of programs and then uh, plug in elements that could be uh, hanging or standing. Next. Um, during the different sessions, we worked to optimize the main structure, which we have chosen to present today. The initial structure consists of uh, concrete cores uh, timber with timber floors, uh, columns, uh, beams as well as a timber truss. 
you can see that. Next. Our initial uh, analysis tells us that the overall structure presents a low utilization, uh, both in shells and beams, giving us the possibility to plug in uh, new elements by stacking and hanging. Uh, where, the floors, uh, where the floor is can deliver in the lower parts, uh, the model presents some deformation, suggesting either uh, increase the number of supports or the, the floor thickness. Next. Uh, when it comes to self-load only, we can see that the core uh, on the left, as well as the thrust on, and beams on the upper, upper floors are the ones working the hardest, as the center of the building has less supports. Next. When it comes to wind load, most of the displacements are happening around the single core on the right, since it's, it's, it's taking most of the lateral forces. Still, the maximum displacement here is only 0 0.55 centimeters. Next. For the, for the shell elements, uh, we can conclude that most of the displacement is happening on the upper part of the building. In consequence, we would need additional supports or increase the size of the support members. Uh, similar to the floor to the floor and course, the areas where the beams uh, elements are being displaced the most uh, are the same. They can deliver areas in the upper part of the building. Uh, when it comes to uh, shell utilization, uh, we can we can see that the wind loads uh, the cores are being utilized mo uh, much uh, much more um, than for the other the other two loads at the maximum of 39% compared with 20% and 12%. Since, the, since here, the cores are preventing lateral movement. Next. Uh, regarding beam utilization, this, the structure seems, seems to show the expected results for the different parts with the trust elements doing most of the work due to its nature. Next. Bending for both columns and beams seems to, to be equal distributed in both directions for gravity and self-load, but less for wind load, where the bending is bigger in some areas than in others. Next. Taking a closer look at the columns forces, we can see that they are more in compression uh, for the first two loads, but more in tension for wind load. Here, depending on the different plug-in strategy, we might, we might need to consider some additional uh, reinforcement. And then we proceed to make some adjustments to the initial structure. Um, here, because the goal here is to create this uh, stable mainframe to house our plugins, uh, we had to make sure that this was all uh, fully covered first. So based on the previous analysis, this part of the cantilever uh, is, uh, 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 drooping a little bit, so we had to increase uh, the uh, cross section from 30 cm to 50 cm, and that proved to, to um, reduce the displacement. Next. Yeah, and uh, so by adding an additional shear wall, the utilization of the shell elements is reduced by only 1%. And there's little change to the displacement. It seems like the additional wall is not doing much to the overall core structure here. However, once we start stacking and hanging spaces, it could help in supporting the additional loads. So as you can see in the, in the red box, uh, that is with the shear wall, and it's only um, reduced by 1%. And this is something that we intentionally did to uh, oversize, make sure that our mainframe is like, can handle the plugins that we were about to add on, which brings us to the next slide. The plugin stacking and hanging. Um, so this one is stacking uh, one. Uh, the overall structure is still stable after adding floors to the existing structure. There's a little displacement to both the beam and shell element elements and the utilization is at a maximum of only 20%. Uh, 
uh, which is it has to work harder than that. Um, hence, we can add more loads to this existing structure. And next, it's, that's exactly what we did. Um, stacking two, um, we added more floors on top of the same area to see if the utilization and displacements change. The results show very little change in displacements. Um, and so here we have definitely over-specified the size of the structural elements and can start looking at uh, working the other way around and reducing the size of elements, taking out what we don't want and what we don't need to make the building more efficient. Um, yeah. Um, so before we started to, to reduce the sizes of the elements, uh, what we wanted to do was to, to check um, with hanging, uh, if there's any displacements and how it affects the utilization of the overall structure. So here, the first uh, iteration of, of hanging uh, <clears throat> the, the floors from the, the truss above, um, we, we can see that there's a bit of displacement in the floors uh, you can see um, in orange here. Um, so then we, in the second iteration, we, we added a few more cables that would support the hanging floors on top. Uh, and that changed the displacement from 2.43 centimeters to 1.9 centimeters. And then we also looked at another strategy of um, hanging elements from the core because from the initial analysis that we did, we saw that the, some of the core um, elements was being underutilized. So we thought of hanging another um, element from these areas that were being least utilized. And by doing this, uh, the, the cores are being utilized more efficiently and um, not being displaced too much. And then the next step was you know, rather than going on adding more spaces and more load, load uh, to the structure, we decided what if we, we see try another strategy of reducing the size of the members um, to make them uh, work more efficiently. So we did the first um, iteration where the, all the columns were 50 by 50 and the beam sizes were 30 by 30. And in the second one, we reduced all the columns by uh, to, from 50 to 30 um, centimeters. But we can see in the lower half and uh, the bottom half that the uh, the columns are still being under underutilized, as you can see the red um, elements. So in the third step, we reduced only the bottom columns to 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters. And then in the fourth step, um, what we did was rather than reducing even further, we removed um, some of these um, columns uh, to reach a utilization of 38.6%. Uh, um, so, with, with doing these exercises, we sort of um, then went on to look at the entire uh, structure, um, adding in all the different loads, uh, all the different load cases. And for the shell, uh, we can see that the utilization is 40.6% and for the beam, 71%. And also displacement is only a maximum of 2.45. Um, centimeter of displacement for the entire structure. So with this, we can we can sort of say from the final analysis that we can still add um, a bit more load to the, the structure, either by hanging or by stacking in some of the areas where it's still being underutilized. And we can sort of also conclude that this structural strategy of having uh, a big truss system on top and a very stable bottom structure um, can allow us to have um, large open areas um, without uh, columns in certain areas. Thank you. Woo! Perfect. Just uh, just outside the ten minutes, so very very good. No, guys, great. I think it's very methodological. Uh, you know how you go all the time, kind of step by step, kind of working through it, and I think it's really exciting and also. Because now in this way, we thought about a kind of plug-in, but obviously, you know, in future, even for existing buildings, we will need to assess, you know, actually where maybe the structure is actually over-designed because we are not utilizing all of its uh, um, capacities. 
So I think this is really an important piece of work also to think for, you know, how this would sit in working with exi existing buildings uh, later on. Great. So yeah. we are going to continue with two more groups. So I hope everyone, all the critics are making notes um, because then we have a larger chunk where, uh, yeah, we can have a bit of discussion about all of the works. So then we continue with group eight. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Who is just Abdulaziz, but yeah. uh, that's it. Well done. We look forward to hear it. Thank you. Uh, do you see my skin now? Yeah. Okay. Um, um, my structural optimization design is completing with uh, my uh, studio project, uh, which is a student's, uh, student's housing pro uh, program, uh, which is located uh, in uh, Riyadh uh, in Saudi Arabia. This uh, my site. It's uh, nearby uh, the university uh, campus. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is the final uh, final uh, uh, render of, of uh, um, uh, my uh, capsules units. My architecture, uh, my sorry, uh, my structural uh, objective uh, are analyzing the structure with initial design, and we will check with uh, the an, a new or experiment uh, number uh, two, and I and it, uh, I identify the weak points and optimize the structure and validate uh, validate the final uh, design uh, start with the structural uh, component it's uh, uh, based on uh, supports then bearing columns then slabs then uh, beam network then the stiffness uh, stiffness uh, cores then uh, we have the uh, envelope or the skin of our uh, building, which is the pre uh, precast uh, reinforcement. Now we have also to reducing the, the, the mass load of the building. We add uh, which uh, which uh, which I shown uh, in the presentation. Now uh, the um, escaping uh, staircase, which is the the blue one now. This is our vertical cores and this is our escaping uh, core. This is uh, my program uh, or my building uh, components um, of, uh, from housing and uh, public area. And this uh, uh, my description of structural element, but however, it, 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 uh, it has been uh, changed. For example, here in slab in first, uh, in first uh, experiment, uh, I, uh, I bought it uh, concrete, which is a really weak um, material. Then I changed, uh, when, uh, and we will see uh, how, how before and after. The initial analysis results, it's become, uh, I see the, 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 uh, the displacement focused on uh, my uh, cantilever um, area. This is my maximum displacement. And this is my uh, NY and uh, uh, MY uh, bending moment. But this, uh, as I told, it's the first uh, experiment. After that, I'm, I'm trying to add uh, abrasions around the um, uh, opening or massive, huge, uh, massive uh, openings uh, around the cantilever. But uh, what I, 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 I show, or, or sorry, what I uh, see, it's not really big different uh, when I add the manually bracing, uh, steel bracings uh, with the displacement. So what I did, I, I and, and identify the maximum or the highest uh, uh, stressed uh, capsules, which is uh, getting the red and the blue one. And I uh, add for that, uh, just for the highest uh, stressed faces, uh, 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 put the, for them um, uh, bracings. So uh, what I get, uh, I, 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 I saw it, it's become different with the maximum displacement. Now uh, I'm increasing the concrete slab thickness, uh, maximum displacement, it, it, it was 1.6. And just I exaggerated, just uh, exaggerated just for showing the, uh, the deformation. Now I I I uh, pieces that are deformed the, the most uh, with 
it's become 63% uh, of the deform, it's horizontally, uh, the, and the vertically it's uh, 37. So it was um, it's, it's because the slab slab concrete. Mm -hmm. And now what what I use I'm trying to reduce and or optimize my building uh, by a piece of tool and caramba. Uh, that makes my, um, uh, let's say, my, my building weight with the same displacement, but we change that or reduce the weight, but the, the displacement, it, it will be the same. Final results, the, this my um, axial uh, stresses, and this the bending moment, that's it. That's it. Thank you so much, uh, Abdulaziz. And also, as you guys saw before, so some groups have three students, others two, and Abdulaziz only on his own. So I think it was really great. And also, I really liked how you, um, you know, kind of strategized where now to place, um, you know, the bracing based on the analysis. So I think that is really great. So well done. Um, okay, then let's continue with the final group, which is group three. Yes, ready. I'm going to share the screen. Okay, can you guys see the screen? Yeah. Perfect. Okay, welcome to our final presentation for the digital tools for structural optimization strategies with group number three. That is uh, Andrew Kulukulak, Herman Bodenbender, and Sergey Krichkov. Um, we base uh, our structural analysis on, on the project we did for our complex forms scenario. And for that, we create a quick manifesto. And the manifesto was about when we create a system that is open source, is modular, can be assembled and disassembled. That's really important for us. And also, it can be locally sourced, all the materials. And also, we want this system to be able to be used in multiple sites and multiple locations. It can be arranged as a plaza, as a overhead spaces, as walkways. We started a research looking inspiration into a, a type of plant that we researched deeply that is called the Washingtonia robusta. And we started researching from this plant is actually the concept of how we've got a center, we've got a, a central pillar and then from that we've got a linear polar array and also how each lead create different kind of folding angles and how by the folding of the material we create structural stability and long spans into it. So we started researching this principle and also we started doing a very first early parametric approach into it. We started exploring different angles, the strength, the span, and the, the final system composition. So then the question for us is how can we take this system and create a structural and stable system by the use of foldable strategy? So then we started a full funding process. So but then we naturally, uh, we naturally then learned into origami and how by the folding of elements, we can increase the structural stability. So then by the use of kangaroo, we started a multiple folding approach. So we started with a very, very simple pattern. And for us to start understanding the folding principles, and we went through multiple interactions that we just recap some of them here. But as you can see, we started from the top left with a simple concept of a, of, of a rectangle, and then we started to modify it in order for us to achieve something that is, is, is a central, is a central element that spans on a 360 scenario. I want to quickly show you here what one of the quick tests of, of the folding principle that we use on using Kangaroo, the Grasshopper plugin. So then, based on that, we arrived to the final, I mean, to the very, <laughs> to the final flow form from exploration. That it looks something like this. I want, to, I want to show you later the structural analysis. Then quickly on the material research, we want this one to be local, locally built. Um, so that's why we started research between plywood and solid timber. We started running the comparison between the two of them. And we started going through the concept of marine, uh, marine plywood to give us solid panels that allow us to cast shadows underneath. And also because actually it also give us an, an anisotropy material because the way that the, 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 the sheet of wood are laminated and cross laminated in different directions, in our opinion, ended up creating an anisotropy material that helped us to distribute the forces on, on both directions really well. That is something that we need on a pavilion. And also by its potential how this material is optimized for CSC cutting and can be locally built. And then also we did a quick research on, on what is joint and that, that, that different type of joints and assemblies. So then we researched different type of connections and then we want something that could be easily, easily manufactured and assembled on site. 
That's why we ended up we ended up um, going for a batch wrap up join that allow us to 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 create simple connections by by the use of CNC machining, and also how we can create separate parts that can be unique angle conditions connected to it. Um, and also this is going to give us at the end not movable joints. It's going to be uh, solid um, constraint joints on all directions, and also you know because we don't have a specific site, but it could be adapted to multiple sites. How we think how it will connect to the sites, to the ground through the connection of solid well with steel plates. And basically it's gonna be fixed onto concrete, the ground, that will be the, the type of foundation we'll have. And I will pass into my colleague, Andrew, to talk about the structural analysis. version, um, learn the mistakes from this and apply our new knowledge to further inspiration. Uh, so our, the first uh, first version that we got from Kangaroo um, is is this uh, big one that you see on the left with a big cantilever, and um, so we we analyzed it, and um, immediately we can see in the next slide that um, the big cantilever is quite problematic. It's causing quite a bit of stress, um, and it wants to fall down. Uh, once we started looking at the wind analysis, we learned that. Um, the the cantilever catches uh well given that it has a lot of area to receive the push of the wind it the wind causes the structure to rotate which um, which causes a lot of stress on on the legs um and and that is something that we learned um so we 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 looked at other versions of uh um well, sorry before that the the conclusions that we took out from the version one is that um, it's very prone to tipping our structure, given that it has one closed leg, uh, and that is something that we can work with in the next version. And also, we learned that the type of fold um, is important in the distribution of forces. So, for example, the V load that you see here uh, is not very ideal for the structure, as uh, it makes it, it makes a lot of comp uh, t tension forces go from the side panels, uh, given that it doesn't have particular support besides the one panel going into the center. So we looked at other versions, uh, also taken out from our kangaroo process. Um, and what we did with the version two, in the next slide you will see, we made it much more symmetrical. And also we opened the legs. Um, and this, this gave us better results um, that you will see in the next slides. Um, you can see that the uh the, the legs given that they are triangular and have a just a singular support point so kind of like a sharp tooth and um, they receive quite a bit of stress and um and it's not very it's still very not very ideal um in the in the in the next slide you will see that uh you no know, when comparing forces we can see that the gravity load uh, causes the most displacement, and that is again due to the legs. The structure tends to want to fold uh, back into um, kind of flat, uh, flat structure. Um, and so we, what we learned from here, we took into the version three, and um, well, the symmetry first they allowed us to make the uh, make the structure larger. Um, so and this is what, seven minutes. We have three minutes left. Okay, I'll speed it up. The the major improvement that we did with version three is that we opened the leg into uh, into a new W shape, and you can see that you can see in the next analysis that it has improved uh, the stability. Um, the given that each leg is is now not just a one point but multiple. Um, it's able to distribute the weights better, and you can you can still uh, see that uh, it's prone to uh, it's prone to deformation. Um, sorry, I'll run even quicker. Uh, next slide, please. So when when we compare the two, we can see that um, the, the version four with the new legs is much less prone to try to fold inwards. Um, next, please. Um, and and we can we can also see that uh, version three is 
much better, well, much better at uh, distributing the, the loads, as I said before. So the conclusion was that uh, the W-shaped leg is, is much better. Um, and the symmetry is also an important factor uh, because it allows for uh, well, more stability. Um, we did further analysis, and Sergey will talk about that. Um, yeah, and um, <clears throat> uh, any folded structure uh, tends to unfold and uh, get back to its uh, original flat shape. Uh, so as an extra measure of um, uh, pulling this structure together, we uh, used, used cables and we have investigated uh, two options. Uh, one was uh, the, uh, uh, in option one, we attempted to, uh, yeah, go ahead, please. We attempted to connect the um, far ends of the structure and the analysis immediately shown that uh, it was a wrong assumption um, because uh, apparently uh, in a cantilever uh, the, the main stress is not in the end but uh, where it is rooted to the uh, vertical part of the structure. So then uh, in the next uh, attempt we have relocated the cables uh, closer to the center of the uh, structure pulling parts together and uh, it did work perfectly. So um, here uh, both uh, the cables don't tear apart and the mesh uh, performs better than uh, in any other uh, option untied with cable. And um, that's, our, uh, um, that's our final uh, final version for the moment, but uh, indeed uh, it, we, we see that there is a lot of uh, things to do ahead uh, and uh, optimize it further. And now I will pass it back to Arman to conclude. So finally, but not least, you know, with this idea that this structure can be deployed in multiple scenarios. And this is just a final rendering impression on how the system can be implemented locally on different, different scenarios. And this is kind of the final composition shape and structure of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Thanks. I am very happy to see, you know, also more exploration like with the table and really looking at into the different geometries. So I think that is really is really great. And obviously we know it's very difficult to compare as well when we make kind of these kind of big changes uh, to the geometry. But I think that's really um, yeah, really good presented so thank you very much okay then i'm going to give the floor to the critics um so we have now deny raymond and adrian and yeah so in total guys you have like let's say 20 minutes so i don't know maybe i don't know if you want to who of you wants to start and then maybe we can just all kind of either focus uh, on a different group or if you have general comments um yeah it would be great to say something about <clears throat> all the works I've, I've got a general comment. So uh, I'm coming from outside of an understanding of the project. So I have to try to pick up all of the information and understand all of the thought processes quite quickly. So some were better at kind of laying out the strategy that, than others. Mm -hmm. but a, a lot of it though comes to understanding what's the right diagram for this system. So it's really interesting in the flow of the process here about how decision making is informed in that process and how that's adapted through either exploration of forces. Um, I would have been looking to, well, what's the right diagram for this system overall? So there's a difference between computational analysis to inform a direction for the design and actually just a fairly simplistic idea of well, what's, a, what's the appropriate diagram for this building structure. So in each one of them, um, and in the sketches I've done in my book here, I'm trying to understand what is the, you know, the, the major decisions and performance issues to do with the structure, which would inform an approach to an analysis there. So um, in, in the middle one on the student housing, it's what well, there's some major cantilever or spanning systems in the, the total system. Those are the major issues to approach. In the last one, it's really interesting about, well, okay, you've got a cantilever and you've got a series of an imbalanced cantilever systems. How, how would that overall system work? Not as what the specific kind of uh, performance of it. Um, and similarly for the first one, you know, you've got a series of kind of, uh, elements which are introduced into it. So what's the overall diagram here 
about the system and how do I then use the analysis to, um, to satisfy that understanding. So actually, would it be quicker if you drew a diagram on a piece of paper rather than do lots of complex analysis to get to a similar answer? And I would be tempted on all of them, I'm afraid, to kind of have done a more, this is what we think the overall stability or structural system might be. And that might give you greater direction and emphasis of then what the analysis is trying to demonstrate and you know where you put your effort into it. So I, yeah, I, there's a balance between using complex analysis to do analysis and using complex analysis to actually solve problems which are not solvable through fairly simple structural system uh, design approaches. So I would look at the diagram first and make sure that you're answering the right question with very sophisticated analysis in this case, and across all three of them. So the analysis is not disputed, it's where do you put your emphasis in the design? Yeah. I guess if, if it, I, I guess this might be also due to the fact that, um, well, this is a class about these tools um, to some degree and uh, I'm sure like if it was a, a, a design, let's say a comprehensive design studio, uh, that, that would be the, that, that, that would be the, the, the better approach. Um, I suppose that in, in the time that you had to develop these projects, you kind of, uh, because it is about these tools as well, you kind of uh, had to use them, <laughs> which makes sense to learn them. Uh, but yeah. I, I, I agree with Adrian that that uh, in the kind of in the sequence of developing an architectural project, uh, these tools, in the way that you've used them here, are maybe kind of too uh, introduced too early. Um, yeah, that just uh, in 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 response to that, and then I don't know if we should shift to the or if Dana has also some uh, general comments. Yeah, no, I, I really like uh, the projects, all three projects again, and all the variations that you have done. Um, I, I will agree with Andrea on, on the sense that if you had uh, an initial diagram explaining, let's say the structural strategy of, of your building, um, it usually helps because you know from where you start and where you're going. But um, yeah, I think it's nice to use Caramba, especially because <laughs> That, that's the class where you, you learn how to use uh, these tools and how these tools can inform uh, your design uh, decisions. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, shall we go into... Uh, Maybe I'll, clo I'll close this loop with my, with my views on this because obviously it would be awesome to have diagrams, but I also noticed actually it's not very easy to do that, right? So sometimes, for example, we can understand better which elements are actually, you know, working to as part of our stability system? Because when we put wind on it, we can see ah, actually these walls, as for example with Group Two, we could say, hey, that wall there is not doing anything. And us, let's say, with an engineering background, could have kind of told you maybe more immediately, saying, well, that one is not in the right direction, let's say, of the wind, so it will not be as efficient. So, but I think that there's a balance between this, right? But somehow try to simplify. And I think, uh, Sergey, when you had the, the little kind of diagram, for example, showing, well, if I have the cable in the top, then I still have my bending issues in the middle of the kink. But if I have the cable here, then I don't have these issues. And I think it's good to, to do it in both ways, either try to start with it or even to conclude with it, because somehow this is also like, for let's say all of us who doesn't who don't have a training let's say on an engineering site to try to capture what is then the essence of what it is that you you gain from that yeah sometimes it helps looking at examples of uh, similar buildings and see what uh, strategy they have followed and what how they combine the elements in order to achieve what you're also trying to achieve in a way it can be your starting point I was really interested in the, <clears throat> the selection of um, parameters around either limit states 
uh, or serviceability kind of aspect. So there's a bit about strength and stiffness there. Uh, and I think that's really, yeah, that's really important that they get this. So in the optimization, when you're optimizing, and everybody was talking about by the utilization or optimizing, what are you optimizing for? So uh, really critical then to kind of determine what are the, the most important elements of it. So we had some good emphasis of kind of deflection criteria or strength criteria. And some of that's quite difficult to then kind of show what the critical parameters are. And I think that was, you know, that was handled well. Uh, on the, the last one, there's a, a lot of similarity of open source system design with kind of work did on WikiHouse, um, which was, con a lot of that was also, also included um, panel sizes. So the, a, another parameter of the optimization might be utilization of materials compared to sourcing. So it'd be nice to kind of talk a bit about, about that. So material optimization is that in um, off-site systems is often about, well, what are you left with when you cut it out of a system? So um, yeah, panel parameters in the sizes of that saw of that um, structure would be also quite interesting to include. So in the cantilever elements, what length of panel can you actually get if you're using plywood? And is there another in-length joint rather than just the, um, the seam joint and in plan? So that'd be quite an interesting area about uh, where that would go, uh, go in. Um, yeah. Uh, may I get some? Uh, may, I be, may I give you some feedback on this issue? Um, the thing, the thing is that um, we actually uh, are designing the next version of uh, those panels for uh, the for the other class from this from which this project comes originally, and uh, they uh, finally get turned into uh, into a grid of uh, ribs with gaps between them, exactly for the reason that you have mentioned that uh, we do need to save material and uh, get less uh, refuse, but this just uh, couldn't, couldn't get into the structural an analysis because it appeared too late in the design. Mm. Oh, wow. Ah. <laughs> so, well, I'm sorry. Uh, since we are uh, inside this project now, maybe I, I kind of uh, stay there for a bit um, with the group three and also the, the last group. So my first um, uh, my first question would be, why did you insist on the origami logic, which is a logic of making something from a flat sheet of paper. And it has a unfortunate property that because it can be unfolded, it also, if you load it, it wants to unfold. So then you have to solve all these, uh, you have to make it, um, instead of locking it geometrically and choosing a, a, ge a geometry that cannot unfold in itself, you have to go at great lengths to, you know, introduce these uh, moment fixed joints um, and uh, also at, at the bottom where you could have a released joint where it is connected to the foundation, um, where it would be perfectly appropriate to have a very thin uh, cross section uh, at, the, at the, the point where it is connected, you, you, you have to make the, the leg wider and, and, and stuff like that. So. I think you could have made your lives much easier if you had um, kind of dropped the the origami, uh, let's say, uh, logic of unfoldability in favor of the opposite, something that cannot be unfolded, and then you would not have uh, you would not have to use uh, you know moment fixed connections. You could actually have everywhere. Um, um, uh, you know, um, rotating joints between between your your uh, between your your planes, so so kind of uh, um, hinge folds, um, and you would not have to introduce these stiffeners in the corners and 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 all these all these other things. 
So um, I think maybe that would be good to revisit like kind of this initial decision because it might give you a, a much purer structure that is also more elegant and uh, uses material more, more efficiently because you don't have uh, all of this uh, transfer of bending which results in, in, in fat kind of cross sections and, and, and things like that. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, I, I guess looking at the tensile structure might have made more sense uh, uh, taking into consideration the long spans uh, that you had. Otherwise, you have to introduce, like, for example, trusses in order to deal with uh, the deflections that you would get at the tips of, uh, of the cantilevers. Um, and also another comment I have about the legs, uh, because you are doing this study with, a, I think it was a U-shape. Um, also, uh, if you look at arching structures, uh, they, they tend to be quite uh, efficient when it comes uh, to vertical uh, loads, and they can also provide uh, lateral stability or a triangulation of, of the legs as well. Maybe it can be another option. Uh, that uh, you can uh, study if you have uh, time. Uh, I think these are all the comments I have for uh, the last group. Thank you. Yeah, then let's continue with the other two groups. And yeah. we don't all have to, you know, say some one by one something about uh, each group. It's okay to do like however, right? Yes. So, uh, I thought on the second one, the student housing, um, it, it's interesting about this. I thought it was really interesting about the selection of the framing approach uh, there, like the core and then sticks and then looking at bracing for the element. So uh, the, there might be a bit more in there about uh, I think you, I think you use the word capsules. So in looking at the diagram, it was actually <clears throat> there might be more planar elements in there which were doing the work, and that actually might change the original idea about cause for stability as well. So there's there's something about the modules in that dial. You know, the make the major diagram again about system of bracing which would be interesting to explore in that in that approach but it goes back to how do you get the cantilever elements um <clears throat> when, when it came to optimization and the material selections i was a little uh you know a lot of emphasis on the displacement of the roof form where the, the overall building displacement elements might be more critical than what was explored uh, and maybe in all of them there was a bit about <clears throat> well what were the assumptions in the optimization again so material selection and material performance, I think was quite important there. And some of the um, the other decisions in the modeling that go along with that. So, you know, the anisotropic nature of uh, timber was noted uh, in the concrete elements, you know, short and long-term properties have a major difference in terms of kind of deformation. Uh, you know, how was that explained? Um, and in the use of steelwork and steelwork framing, that's fairly self-evident what those would come. But again, it comes to, well, what when you're optimizing, are you optimizing against units of weight or actually optimizing against available section elements when it comes to, to those as well? So I think a little bit more exploration in those would be really useful in getting into some of the material constraints and how that affects the modeling and the assumptions that were made. That's probably the background to it, but that would be quite interesting to explore. Okay, uh, I actually, um, and also maybe because it was the first group that I saw, I, I had uh, a lot of notes on the on the first group, group two with Amar. Um, so first of all, uh, these kind of structures, um, they 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 are pretty cool. Uh, th there are some precedents. Um, I don't know if you looked at references there, there is like the, the faculty of law building in Vienna, which works exactly in this way. Uh, so it has a, a gigantic bridge on top, which is resting on two concrete cores and then everything is hanging from there. 
Uh, and then in Barcelona, we have uh, we have another example, which is the MediaTek by uh, by Cloud9, um, which also works in this way. Um, and 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 I have never actually been inside the MediaTek, but I have been in in the in the Faculty of Law in Vienna, um, actually on an architectural kind of tour inside. So we were also able to access the space inside of this massive bridge uh, um, on top. And it's actually quite a, um, an attractive space because you have, you know, like the, it's divided by all of these, um, what, by the, by the, by the, 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 uh, the trust structure. Um, so, so I was wondering, for example, if in your, in your proposal, you would also use this space because obviously you need the structural height. So this is a proper kind of, I don't know, four or five meter, uh, um, you know, hall that you would have up there, obviously with all the, the, the steel inside, but uh, that can be, you know, exploited architecturally as well. Um, and then I was wondering the, on the, on the, on the lowest level, like the, you have like this one floating uh, level that is hanging from the from the bridge, but then you have compress compressive uh, columns under it, and I mean that is one of the one of the cool things that I remember from this building in Vienna is that under the kind of the the the, the floor slab there is nothing. Is like uh, completely open. You don't have any uh, any columns that are in, in compression. Um, so so it's basically just uh, you know the, the glass. Uh, it, it's closed off with glass on all sides, obviously. Uh, but this is a, a, a massive kind of very uh, strange you know open space because you don't see this usually. So uh, I think to go to the extreme of what your structure is, um, I, I would actually avoid introducing these, these compressive elements uh, there. Um, okay. And then, and then one, one comment, and then I stop uh, about the, the variations that you did. So I, I understood you wanted to uh, re achieve a higher utilization of the things that were underutilized, so you just attached more things to them, um, which, which uh, you know, is kind of for me is a, a bit of a secondary question, um, and and maybe the variations they could have, and this is in line with what I said previously, like uh, your variations could have been more focused on what is the essence of your structure, and that is having a massive bridge. And having everything hanging from it, um, so um, you know, like, where can I uh, even remove wires? Or uh, you did this actually. You introduced some more wires, right? Um, but but I would I would shy a bit away from these alterations that are slightly alien to the nature of your of your uh, structural design in favor of those that that uh, are are more closely related. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And very happy, Thanks. very happy to see, to see uh, Amar. Thanks, Raymond. <laughs> Thanks for the comments. I mean... <laughs> Great. Any final comments from you, Danai? Um, so uh, for the first uh, group, I I also like the idea of having the bridge uh, on the top and hanging uh, like the floors uh, from there. But I also like the idea of having a combination uh, of different materials and of uh, different systems, which is something that we do very often, uh, like in um, in in real projects. Um, um and uh yeah so also when uh, you want you want to have uh, like an open space another option is uh, to position the structure along the facade so to have what we call an exoskeleton which uh, gives you the opportunity uh, to have the vertical uh, uh, system uh, along the perimeter and then uh, omit uh, the columns in the internal space 
so this uh, can be another option. Uh, or also uh, you will find that when you start introducing curvature, uh, for example, to your roof. Uh, so for example, you introduce a grid shell. Uh, this can also allow you to have a uh, long spans and also optimize uh, the size of the members and the mass. Uh, uh, as well as the deflection. So structures become more efficient and they distribute the loads um, in a more optimal way uh, when uh, we introduce curvature. So maybe this can also be something that uh, you can explore if it doesn't create other uh, constraints. Yeah. Yep, thank you. Thank you. It's great because everyone sees opportunities. What can we do, right? And I think also, obviously, Adrian's comments are really important about, you know, what it is that you are optimizing for. Is it, you know, to find more standard cross sections? Is it just reducing the weight? Is it, you know, being more closed? Again, for example, in the first group with the philosophy of how you want to grow your building or where the plug-in you know, kind of uh, aspects to your building should go. So I think this is also something that is indeed important, um, yeah, to communicate. Can I just add very briefly to that? Because yeah. I'm, I'm right in the middle of this on a, on a live project and we're stuck in the middle of optimization for uh, strength and stiffness and material weight compared to optimization for embodied carbon reduction. And so, you know, I would really encourage you as well to kind of look you know, the, the, the field of optimization which can be done is really important. And that must now include um, kind of aspects of material environmental impact. So, uh, yeah, it, it's even in a simple thing like a steel structure, when you've got three or four different types of steel impacts for different sections, whether there's plate or section or hollow, you know, you, you find that some of the optimization done by the engineers is not actually is very different from what's traditionally been done, which is on a weight base compared to a carbon base. So I would I would encourage you to kind of get into some of that as well, if you can. For me, even better, right? Because I also think we, we are long gone of, you know, just only kind of reducing weight. And it is good to, you know, kind of challenge the overall kind of structural system, the diagram, as we started this discussion with. Um, but then also, I think indeed very, interesting and obviously we have not been able to do everything we wanted to do for this course um but yeah thinking about the sustainability and how that would impact um yeah is of course great um yeah okay then thank you very much again for the uh the last uh well the previous three groups for all of their uh great work um, so, yeah, then we continue with the final three groups, and we have group six, nine, and four. And we have also Nina Tabing, who has just uh, joined us, so structural engineer from Arab, um, and also good friends with Adrian. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice. Look, it's uh, everyone knows each other. It's really nice um, to have a, a yeah this great group of critics here. So, okay, let's continue then with the final uh, final three groups. Polina, are you ready to go? Say that again. Am I? What? Are you ready to go? You are the first yeah, one, yeah, yeah. group six. Yeah. Uh, Can I go last, Manya? I think we agreed with one other. I can go last. Um, okay, for me it's fine. So either group nine or group four, then would you guys like to start? Yeah, sure. Uh, group nine is uh, ready. Great. Okay, go for it. So I will put again seven minutes timer with then again three minutes timer. Let's try to have it uh, with uh, within the 10 minutes. Okay, guys, then go for it. I am to remote control. I'm oh, sorry, I need to keep that. Okay. Yep. Uh, all right, so.
First, we would like to uh, begin with introduce our teammate, me, uh, Nawapan, uh, Benno, and Jonathan. And today we would like to present about our structural design according to the studio work that we have integrated between the ventilation elements and the structural design in order to create a function to the structure elements, mainly including the outer facade, inner facade, and building core uh, structure for our project. For our project, we have simple uh, concept for our building called box in box system. That is to say our building will have two layers, including the outer box for shading and protection uh, system and the inner box for the living space. That is uh, in between is the buffer area to reduce the hot air and allow ventilation between two boxes. In this context, according to the uh, context uh, wind factor, it appears that the wind have blow from the southeast to the northwest, which in this case, the long uh, horizontal fa uh, facade will face a lot of wind pressure and wind forces. That is, that's mean like a building required to have a shear wall that is strong enough to react against the wind force. In order to achieve our goal for using carbon neutral materials, we end up using the cross bracing structure for our design with timber material. Um, roof, atrium core, inner facade, outer facade, and slabs will be constructed with timber, while we have also prepared one core with concrete materials as a default uh, to compare how much different between using concrete and timber. So first, uh, we have to make sure that the wooden uh, structure that we designed can support our uh, dead load from materials at it is a 17.5 meter height building which is quite high for using timber as main structural material. However, we would like to achieve our goal to use a carbon neutral based material. So the next step uh, uh, is our experiment to find the optimal uh, solution. Starting with the inner box structure, we create a three strategy for the core to support slab load, including the test one is the default option with a concrete circular uh, core. The test two is the wooden cross bracing shear wall and the test three to combine uh, with Eclipse wooden structure as we would like to continue as floor uh, that allow flexibility to activity program inside the building. And as a result with the concrete core, it seemed that it is uh, working very really well with a super small displacement, but in terms of material, it is seven to nine times comparing to the other. Meanwhile, the test number two have less performance for gravity support uh, than number three, which Option number three is, uh, has the less uh, massing. And on the next page, Jonathan will continue presenting and showing how the wind force effect to the inner box cost structure. Uh, John, uh, are you mute, Jonathan? I'm not hearing you. Jonathan, uh, you, you are mute. Or at least we can't hear you. Mm, yeah, yet uh, right now. Now yes, yes. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah, so I'm going to do it like uh, fast from this point. Uh, yeah, basically we applied the same uh, exercise, but in this case with the wind load, uh, we applied uh, a wind load of uh, 1.5 kilonewtons per square meter, and we are. Uh, working with our facade in the long area, uh, we have uh, 2,300 uh, square meters around. Uh, in the first test, what we could see, uh, as Nawapan said, it's a really heavy system, uh, but uh, the utilization is quite good. Uh, however, the connection between the, the, the core and the slab, it's uh, really stressed. In the, seg in the second uh, test, we could uh, conclude that the system, the diagonal system is working really good. Uh, loads is distributing really, really good. Uh, there's a low uh, utilization still, but it's, it's quite good. We could uh, kind of reduce the, the size of the dimension of the, of the diagonals. In the third uh, exercise, we could uh, conclude that uh, it, it has a high utilization, but uh, it has a, a quite uh, high displacement uh, for, in comparison to the second one. Um, here, yeah, here we, we, we could see like uh, applying all the, the load cases uh, and uh, in test three, we effectively see that it is, uh, it is displacing too much and it's deforming much more than the second test. For the roof, we did the, the same analysis. In this case, um, 
we wanted to analyze how could we uh, connect the main core with the roof. So in this uh, exercise, what we compare was the connection between them. So we, we applied two different strategies to have uh, diagonal connections or to have these uh, continuous vertical columns. Uh, both systems, they, they have a high utilization, but uh, we could see that uh, with the diagonal connections, we have a, a better, uh, we, we reduce the displacement of the element. We also went uh, uh, to the roof and the facade, we apply the, the gravity case. And uh, in this exercise, what we wanted to see is uh, if we should do a high density facade with uh, this diagonal system, or if we could have a, a lower density. And uh, what we could conclude from this exercise, it's that uh, we didn't have to increase too much the, the density. It could be uh, already a, a lower uh, density. The, the load distribution is working really good. Uh, we have a utilization of 31%. We could reduce the dimension of the, of the diagonals. Uh, and we could also reduce the, the weight of the, of the building. Um, like right now, like I will um, speak about the 3D model. Like we choose all the, no. um, we choose all the 2D analyzers to develop our um, 3D um, model. Uh, I can't use the um, the remote control. It's not working. Um, Okay, like, um, anyway, we put um, like a wind loads for the 3D model in uh, from uh, two, two sites, like, a gravi uh, like gravity and uh, the wind load from one side to the uh, longer uh, facade. Next one. Um, like, I will just fly by um, each element, um, uh, which we tested, like for the, for the vertical um, ventilation, we have this in our core, it's a, it's a wood construction. But you see, uh, like in the NX diagram, it's uh, bring the loads or like from the roof and the facades down to the ground. I mean, it's quite high right there. And uh, next one, um, here's the core, uh, which uh, Jonathan mentioned and Abafan as well, um, which is concrete. You see here that um, it takes for sure like uh, vertical loads, but also uh, like the, the shear loads, like uh, from, from the wind direction uh, on, you know, like the tension, uh, it's, you know, like, um, on the left side is higher than on the right side. It means uh, it takes uh, wind load. Next one. Uh, these are the slabs. Uh, um, you see here just uh, on the connection points, uh, they are um, quite high in, in the, the tension because it's a, a modeling problem. Um, I mean, not problem, but uh, again, we have it very uh, precise and it will be better. Uh, and, and also like uh, the, the slabs take, take also the, the, the wind load. You see it in the shear force. Next. Um, this is the, the, inner I mean, the inner box um, with the, the diagonal structure. You see it in the NX diagram. It brings uh, like um, all the loads from, not all the loads, but uh, the loads from the slab and also from the roof down to the ground. You see in an NX diagram, it becomes like uh, bigger to the ground, means you know, like more loads to the ground, which is obvious. <laughs> Next. Um, here's the roof, like uh, this is a shell. Um, and uh, you see here the, the connection points with the vertical ventilation system it means the core and the connection points means these points are, you know, like I uh, have a lot of tension for sure, uh, makes sense. Um, and also take also uh, shear forces from wind, next. Mm, like we have also uh, included um, connector between the, the, the two like boxes um, to like bring the like the, the wind forces like from the outer facade to the inner facade and you see it here in an X diagram the facade like the connector are really strong working on the side where the wind is and on the other side you know there is no wind they are not working at the moment um, and you see it also like there when the uh, for the moments you see there where the cores are you know like it's more stable like the four points and the three in between it's a bit less stable because there's you know like no course behind uh, next one and this is the the, the main facade um, like you see it here like in the an X diagram it brings a lot of load uh, it takes a lot of load from um, from the wind um, and also uh, vertical loads. And, and also you see there's something interesting in the M, uh, MY diagram, 
that where the connector are in the lower part of the facade, uh, you know, like the, there are no moments, but on the top part there uh, is, you know, like a more, more, uh, more a moment because there is a uh, less connector, let's say, and then uh, that makes it uh, less stable. Um, next one, uh, I, I will like finish it or conclude it. As a conclusion, um, we can say that uh, you see it here, like the, for the overall uh, model, like the shell utilization and beam utilization is uh, quite low. And also you see like the, all the, 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 uh, the elements which I explained, uh, the average of utilization is quite uh, less. That means there is still uh, the possibility to, to optimize it, to make it more efficient uh, for the next step. Next one. And here, yeah, that's it. Thanks. Great. Guys, such uh, a lot of work and really precisely put and really well explained. I think this is really great. And I hope that, uh, or at least we can all benefit from really going step by step through each of the, the different parts of your analysis. And yes, it's important to have a holistic understanding, but sometimes when there are so many elements and we don't really know what is the external shell doing, what internal core so i think it's super useful that you really did this uh, step by step so um yeah well done so we will continue then with um group four so that uh group six can go last so really um well done yes, guys. we are ready to go great Hello, uh, my name is Natalie, together with Sachin and Harshwa group number four. I will make an introduction to our site location and project, which we've done. Then we will explain in more details each part of the structural analysis and the optimization. Our site is located in Moscow. The site plot is approximately 2000 square meters. The design objective was to create such a space and all year indoor destination, which would offer the local community all the basic social services, a space for interaction, leisure, and possibly work. The requirements for the building would be accessibility, uh, transparency, uh, friendliness, flexibility, and adapt adaptivity, climatic com comfort all the year, sustainability. The building is designed as a new agora, the multi-level gathering space with the multiple social functions stuffed vertically. The low level is resistant uh, and the uh, sheltered semi uh, outdoor space. Each floor of the building is designed as the open space around the vertical walls. The floors are connected by the wide open stair and the elevators are wrapped uh, into the structural facade scheme. In our proposal, the main mass of the building lifted from the ground and opened it for two levels semi-open public space. The main volume consists of five levels, uh, four meter high each and rests on the three cores. We use waffle slabs not only to reach the stability of the whole system, but also to hide the huge amount of communications, primarily heating system. The main facade and central cores are made of timber. We work with the, um, with the few versions of geometry of the facade and central cores, so their shape and their location around central space in regards to the structural stability. The north core contains stairs and elevators. Other two are light wells. We make a comparison of different materials for cores. Deflection and bending stress analysis studies help us to make inf uh, informed variations by changing core position, form, and material. And we made comparison of different materials for slabs as well. Here, overall, utilization and shell stress flow results aids in uh, defining suitable opening locations and connections with facade atrium systems. At the low level, the facade rests on the concrete wall in the ground. To optimize the facade, we're comparing bending and actual forces due to the both vertical and lateral load, which were important to derive conclusions. We were working with the main shape of the facade to optimize the curvature and angles in order to stabilize tension and compression and minimize the size of the beams. And we created an additional support structure in the parts where beams were still deflecting. This diagram shows the correlation between climate limits, structure optimization, and our design workflow. And now we will go in more details about our stability system. Ash? Yes. So in order to create maximum open spaces for the public building, our intent was to create a load-bearing system of vertical light wells and a structural facade system. To optimize the structure, it was necessary to define the homogeneity versus heterogeneity which part distributes the load dominantly or is it equally distributed? 
Uh, so first, we looked into the performance of scores. Will a complete concrete score perform better? How will the geometric variation in its form, size, or location improve its performance? Will a timber concrete hybrid be optimal or a complete timber core be the best option for the structure? These preliminary stress distribution studies, uh, its structural, aesthetic, and functional impacts help us in defining the overall forms of the shell. Then we looked at the performance of facade. Will a timber diagrid facade work as an efficient structural system in isolation? How can its strength and support system be improved for even stress distribution? How do vertical and lateral loading affect its performance? Can a geometric variation with different transparency density help the structure? Then we looked into the performance of slabs. How does a concrete slab affect the structure in terms of gravity load and self weight? Can it be optimized and made lightweight? How does the stress distribution change when the material changes? So now we would look into the overall structural analysis of the uh, system. Uh, so at first, we understand an, on overall analysis, it's observed that the beam elements work harder than the shell elements in transferring loads. It's a very heterogeneous system, and then displacements are not in the permissible limits as per the codes. The elements closer to the shorter tower work the hardest as they have to take load of the floating atrium in the center and also span the long cantilever length between the two towers. The core towers have higher utilization and work harder more towards the top levels. Hence, some conclusions are derived. Uh, when we look at the facade, we see that the southeast and southwest corners with the most winds face the most uh, deformation bending, as well as due to the long span of elements that connect to the lower walls and also adjusting to the smaller core. High tension in the facade that transfers cores to the long span elements, which do not have intermediary supports. We look into the base uh, wall as well as the atrium uh, elements as well. The base is very highly underutilized as the load transfer is weak from the facade to the base. The atrium faces high deformation and works very hard due to the vertical loading as force does not transfer evenly to the lower supports. So under, with these conclusions, then we look into the performance of each element. First, for the performance of cores, we, the key considerations were to analyze the core position, the size and form, and the core material. So in terms of utilization, it is observed that the complete di timber diagrid core works most effectively, while the only concrete core with optimized locations tend to underutilize. Whereas the timber concrete hybrid one, even though it's completely utilized, there is high variance in the larger concrete bases versus the narrower timber chops. Hence, this helps us to understand the even distribution of forces. Overall, there's a high reduction in mass with almost 50% reduction deformation, especially with gravity load on comparing the case four of complete timber to the case one of complete concrete. On optimizing the location, the bending decreases considerably. So after considering other factors like axial stresses of tension and compression as well, it is observed that the most optimized diagrid timber core among all the four cases, predominantly it shows maximum reduction in mass and the amount of material used. Performance of facade. The key considerations to analyze the facade with subdivision pattern, the strength and the support and the transparency. A high bending and displacement are two main issues with regard to the timber facade with long spans. However, by making parts of it solid, an addition, an addition of extra supports helps in reducing deformation and bending. However, they increase the overall mass of the structure and the amount of material used. In the original design of facades, it was important to reduce compression and bending at lo locations near the shorter core and the longer facade beams. The truss and the cables help in considerably reducing the compression and bending. They work better in transferring the load to the concrete mesh in the base. Case three, however, has no improvement in bending in comparison to case two. So after structural optimization, other design factors were also taken into account in terms of wind, comfort, and public plaza. Since most transparency was required on the ground floor, case two was chosen with additional supports. This, however, adds more mass while case three reduces it, but only marginal differences were observed. With the performance of slabs, the key considerations to analyze the slabs were the materials, openings, and the cores, and the structural system. Concrete floors tend to overutilize, especially as it is uh, putting a lot of load of the, getting a lot of load of the atrium and the self weight. The holodeck slab seems to be underutilized, whereas the timber grid beam slabs work quite effectively and are lightweight as well. From case one to case three, considerable reduction in the weight of the slabs, and there is even distribution of the slab. This aids in suitable opening locations and connections with the facade and the atrium systems. Even displacement due to gravity is highly reduced. So as per the program of the building, the flows are envisioned to be free flowing and continuous levels. Thus it's cru crucial to make them lightweight and structural as possible. So the core and the facade become the major stability systems. Hence considering other stress values, the 
all timber floor beam system is selected. Now we look into the overall conclusions in comparison to the first design which we have, and we lead, that leads to the optimized design. So the optimized design of the building entails coarse waffle slabs and facade and timber, and a timber truss with steel cables. The optimized form is lightweight, and the mass of the structure is reduced by 65%. The displacements are within the permissible limits. The beams work better and transfer forces efficiently. This reduces the load of the shell elements. So we have the opportunity to make the shells more lighter in terms of material change. Waffle slab in timber shows much less deformation and transfer stresses from the central atrium much more effectively than concrete floors. Timber digrid core supports the slabs better in vertical loading and works more efficiently in deformation. And there is a significant reduction in the bending moment as well. The, the bending moment of the timber facade reduces with the help of additional trusses and cables. Overall, deformation reduces by 40%. The forces are more uniformly transferred via the core and the shear walls together. For both vertical and lateral loading, the tensile force is reduced by almost 50%, while the compressive forces have significant reduction. The trusses and cables help uh, in this with an important uh, aspect to look into, which is the location of uh, both of these. They have uh, a majority, uh, they, uh, they are majorly uh, effective in long span locations and not required in uh, locations without stresses. The lower level shear wall is now better utilized as the load transfer is better and uh, more even uh, from the facade skirt uh, to the base. The atrium faces lesser deformation due to the vertical loading as the forces are now uh, transferring evenly at the lower uh, supports. The atrium is more non-structural and lighter uh, while the base shear wall is more structural. So here you see the floor plans at various levels, showcasing the open spaces on the various levels that would be used for exhibits uh, for the program. The section illustrates the structure of the building, which becomes the architecture and explores the vertical relation between the different floors. That is a central atrium, uh, staircases, which would work uh, as amphitheater as well, and large open public space at the lower levels uh, with pedestrian crossing. Uh, this is the final view of the project. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well done uh, as well. I think so much information that we're all like, woo, I have seen the project before. So I feel a little bit for the guys going like, oh my gosh, so much. But I think it just really, again, talks about all the different aspects um, that you have considered and also the complexity, let's say, to try to, um, on your own design, try to say something, you know, let's say particular about the structural principles and how you can alter it. And I think what has been really good is that, you know, you change locations of the course, try to think about different materiality, uh, worked with developing the skirt, trying to see which elements are working harder. So I think that actually the whole evolution um, has been really great. So really well done. Um, yeah, great. So let's continue then with the final group. Um, and uh, it is Polina uh, because Amal is uh, not feeling well at the moment. So she's just going to present uh, the work that they have been um, yeah, developing with the two of them for the last few sessions. Yes. Um... Yeah, uh, thanks, Manya, and uh, sorry for the little hiccups today. Um, so our project is located in uh, Melbourne, Australia. Um, it's a mixed-use uh, building, uh, apartments, and a commercial area, which will be a cafe and services. Um, we have basically used uh, WASP uh, and WOWASI um, so we have defined this kind of uh, volume um, and within it we have aggregated uh, various modules um, to arrive to a shape. I'm just mentioning this because we're um, optimizing also for structural, but unfortunately for today's session um, we are not able to show it. Uh, but just wanted to mention that uh, for, for the final um, submission uh, with um, linked uh, the evolutionary solver with Caramba. Um, but yeah, it's very heavy and takes quite some time to um, 
get all the results. So uh, this is a typical floor plan of our building. Uh, some sections. We really wanted to explore prefab in our project, um, and uh, we we really didn't want to create some sort of a, a modular construction that is uh, repetitive. Let's say two modules means uh, one apartment, three modules means three apartments, because usually that's um, very restrictive and um, I've actually worked for a couple of uh, companies that do prefab and modular and uh, that's not the strength of modular construction, let's put it that way. Um, so we wanted to explore uh, prefab um, but also create diverse spaces um, and for this reason we actually looked at not having um, two central cores but having um, number of smaller cores that uh, can um, bring the circulation in the building. And as we were lear learning um, Caramba, we basically um, started looking at that. Um, so we have uh, two uh, very simple modules, um, a rectangular three by six module and an L-shaped module, uh, which works both horizontally and vertically. <clears throat> and that was um, one of the main goals. We started uh, our research by just looking at the impact of uh, not having central cores, but like scattered small cores across the building. Um, I, I'm not going to concentrate on these results, but our um, take from all those exercises was that it is doable and it, it is not uh, necessarily the, the best uh, solution to have uh, just central course so that's why we continued exploring this um, option um, and uh, on top of the modules actually we wanted to start with one part one part that can work both horizontally and vertically that will basically build um, all the modules and can have uh, multiple arrangements uh, we were uh, looking at the uh, uh, stress as well so and um, also considering your recommendation of uh, keeping always the modules as hashtags, um, um, we have used this sort of a frame arrangement. Um, and so between the frames, we'll have um, the same part, perhaps varying in, in thickness. We, we haven't yet simulated for this, uh, but that's, that's the concept. Um, so, yeah, we have started uh, our analysis by looking at a, a cluster of uh, modules and then individual uh, modules and uh, also basic beam analysis. Um, how several modules aggregated would look like. Um, from two L-shaped modules stack, stacked on top of each other, I guess something very obvious for, for you. Um, that here we, we had a problem, so we added um, extra columns to this uh, module and we simulated it uh, with, uh, for various criteria, uh, utilization and displacement and various methods, uh, mesh to uh, line and, and also just as a mesh module. But then because this sort of a module uh, it's really not efficient in terms of materials. Like if we put next to each other two L-shaped modules, we would have uh, the double up of uh, columns. Um, for this reason, we started to look at um, how we can actually use props during the construction. And um, we don't need really a column um, that is going to the bow up. So we tried um, uh, for different uh, options and uh, I guess that's obvious for for structural engineers but for, for us it wasn't really that uh, here only with uh, three columns um, we actually got pretty good results in terms of utilization and uh, also displacement. We also tried with two only columns and with one column in the center of the rectangular module uh, then we created the cluster of those uh, modules 
um, the simple rectangular modules and see how this is behaving. Uh, and again, um, the, the second option with the uh, column in the middle uh, had good results, which uh, basically made us think in that way. And um, we aggregated with this sort of a scenario. And this is basically a module that has three columns. Uh, during construction, of course, we would have um, props. Uh, but in the end, we would always end up having a column here. So the, the displacement we see now won't be, won't be there. Um, we also tested with uh, like different arrangements, like L-shaped on top of uh, a horizontal model, uh, module, like rectangular module, uh, which gave us uh, also quite good results. And uh, yeah, we we need to produce like a um, general um, structural um, um, structural analysis model for the whole building once we have finished the optimization with WOC and uh, Paramba, which hopefully for Tuesday will be there. And that's it. Thank you, Paulina. And I think. Look, I also know that there's so much to do, so I'm really happy uh, that you presented this for both of you. And I really like that, you know, even now when you guys are thinking about the clustering, you are still, let's say, brave enough to say, well, actually, we are using too much material. Let's think about how and where we place columns, how we can then align uh, the different modules together. So I think this is also really good because sometimes we kind of get stuck in just saying, okay, cool, that's it. Yeah, it's working. Now let's keep going. And I think this is really great. So I also think that it is really nice um, to see that, uh, yeah, you are still challenging um, during kind of analyzing because somehow we are using it more as a design kind of tool than purely just analyzing. So I think that is, uh, that is really great. So thanks so much as well for this. Um, yeah, if you want to stop sharing, then we can go um, for the last round of the critics um, views. So uh, yeah, we have the Nye, Adrian, Raymond and Nina um, here with us. And uh, yeah, roughly kind of 20 minutes again uh, to give comments. So I will open the floor to you guys. Oh, Adrian, you're muted. Yeah, there's always that polite pause when nobody wants to go first, right? <laughs> it's uh, okay. You know, you like kind of stunning amount of work that's been done and uh, really difficult to kind of cover that in the time scale. So, you know, it's really impressive um, in terms of that. If I just kind of zip through some of the comments that I kind of noted. So the first one, the Bangkok residential, I thought this was really strong in terms of the approach and that, you know, the simple strategy of a box and within a box. Um, in the plan, you know, the plan of that form, not just the section, is really influential, I think, in the, the approach, because you get significant differences between the kind of uh, long elevation versus the short elevation. So that in plan, not just section, I think that's important to explore. But this idea of um, like a, a low and high density grid, I think, is really influential in terms of understanding the form and its influence on the overall approach and that kind of um, th there's many precedents of that so the early stuff you know if you go back as far as the early studies by Foster's on the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank in um, in Hong Kong you know and how it looked at major different gridding systems for the bracing of that and similarly just the work that I know of because uh, we involved it on the Gherkin it had you know coming to the overall bracing density you know, there was major explorations in a similar way. So this, um, yeah, it's really good to see that in uh, the approach. Uh, I kind of, yeah, the ambition for carbon neutral materials, we could explore at another time, but, you know, very credible. Like, like others, if I'm trying to interpret what you're doing and you talk about a utilization against a percentage, I'd just like somebody to be clear about what the, well, what's a hundred percent in that. So it's a little bit difficult for me to understand that you probably know that from, from doing it, but what's the limit, what's max, 
I'd have liked to have seen. Um, just one comment on this. There was a bit about uh, wind pressures and the differentials between different elevations. So you're always going to get a suction on the back edge of a of a building flow, but there might be some difference in you know the, you know suction pressures and front face uh, positive pressures. So kind of what well, what are those? So there will still be one that. Uh, group four, I thought that was, you know, the skirt and the frame, again, that's, uh, you know, amazing amount of work done on that. Um, no, not really much to say in terms of the, the scale of work, but, you know, you could, could pre in presentation, I would just sort of say you could probably condense that and be more selective of what you present. You know, so there's there's so much information there. Sometimes you've got to be absolutely brutal in what you, you do present in the end and simplify it down to get through the major point. So, um, yeah, loads and loads of work there. I, I'd have liked to understand a little bit more about the waffle slab, actually, and, you know, and how that was performing better than a concrete plate. So, yeah, there's a, there's a little bit of uncertainty in my mind on that. And and the last one, again, yeah, uh, really good explanation there um, about using modular systems. And I think it comes down to the fact that you've got uh, a selection of typologies, which are then influenced quite, uh, you know, in either their position or scale of forces. So typically in um, kind of modular work that you may have worked on before, it sounds like, you know, stacking elements at corners where major force flow comes in. So the connectivity of those boxes, not just the box itself, sometimes has a significant influence on the scale of elements, whether that's the frame or the panel doing the job of work. So um, yeah, it might be important to look at the jointing and connectivity of those. Uh, and I would have thought maybe if there was a chance to explode out the typologies to look at the variants of forces or types, that would be um, maybe just a little bit more to do on it. But yeah, like, like the, the first group, you know, tons and tons of work exploring the use of it. Um, I, I would just look at simplifying the, maybe the communication of the the really major points out of it. There's no denying the scale of the work. That's it. <laughs> Great, thanks, Adrian. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Maybe I, um, oh, sorry. sorry. Go ahead, Dana. Go ahead, Dana. <laughs> okay. Uh, so it's just uh, some general comments. Uh, so I would just repeat the comment I have made. Uh, at the initial uh, session that usually it helps to have a, ben a benchmark to compare to in order to understand where you stand in terms of uh, the, the tonnage, uh, the member sizes, as well as the uh, displacements. Uh, so maybe that's uh, something that you can prepare for your uh, final submission. And um, it's also very nice that uh, in all three projects uh, that we have seen now, but also in the previous one, you have played a lot with uh, with geometry optimization. So it's not just a uh, focus on optimizing the member sizes, for example, uh, which, is, um, which, which is very good uh, that you do uh, optimize the geometry uh, as well. So for example, introducing curvature into the facade or uh, into the roof, uh, playing with the location of the course, uh, but also playing with uh, the number of the vertical supports. So for example, you can introduce more vertical supports, but make them uh, smaller of course, depending on the other constraints that uh, you might have, uh, playing with the spans uh, of the beams uh, or of the, or, of the slabs, uh, optimizing the location of, uh, of the openings and the size of the openings, uh, combining different materials and combining different structural systems. Um, and also another uh, comment about the cantilevering elements and especially the slabs that we have seen at the last project is that you can also vary the thickness uh, of the slab. Uh, so you have a thinner um, slab towards the tip and then it becomes a, a thicker towards the support because this is where you need uh, more material also in order to achieve the connection between the slab um, and the column. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and also uh, having the variation on the size of the members. So starting from uh, smaller sizes on the top, uh, which become 
uh, bigger towards the bottom because again this is where you you're gonna have the accumulation of the forces so it's it's nice that we have seen this in some of the projects and maybe can also see it on on other projects that uh, that makes sense uh, to have um, and yeah and then maybe some thought can be put into uh, the connection of the elements uh, so how do uh, for example, on the diagrid, on the timber diagrid that we have seen, uh, I think it was on the first project, how do you actually connect uh, all of these elements? Because in reality, there, it's not going to be like a, a continuous uh, massive beam, it's going to be cut into pieces and then you have to connect it with the diagonal uh, elements uh, and so on. So maybe this is something that can be, can inform uh, your design as well. Um, yeah, that's all. Yeah, also then I just to say because we haven't really worked with releases and like actually in with joints uh, for this class kind of particular so just so that everyone kind of knows maybe with some guys we went into it, but I think it is important and that is again the holistic kind of design right because still we need to cut up pieces, it is not like just a continuous grid so I think that is still uh, yeah an important point to make great. Okay, then I will just continue to do the same and go through the projects one by one. Um, the first one, the Bangkok residential. So I understood the box in box approach from a, let's say, climatic uh, uh, kind of uh, angle. Um, I didn't fully grasp in the end structurally how they work together, the inner and the outer box. So it was very, I mean, it, it was very clear, like the way that you did your variations, uh, you know, element by element, like with the, with the roof, uh, with the outer box and with the inner box. What I didn't really fully grasp was how in the end they work together uh, and, and also how they are, how they are connected. So, so um, this may be coming back to what Adrian said before about the diagram, like if there was, you know, something that would explain in the end how the entire structure works together, um, that, 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 that would be immensely helpful because you, now also the way you structured your presentation kind of you, you, you started with the variations and then um, uh, at least for me, it was not so clear that then what was the structure you then decided uh, is the best um, in, in terms of all of the elements, in terms of the inner box, the facade, the cores, uh, and, and, and the roof. Um, yeah, so, and, and in connection to that, like the, the, the internal, uh, like, like the beams or the slabs, um, are they just resting on the inner box or are they kind of continues and also touch the outer box. Um, yeah, so, so maybe you can, you can uh, comment on that. And um, okay, or maybe, maybe now would be good before I switch to the other projects. Yeah, there, there was there was one slide that uh, unfortunately we, we jumped perhaps I can uh, fast share my screen. Uh, and it was the exploded uh, axle. Can can you see my screen? Yeah. And uh, yeah, with this one, we we wanted to present all the the elements uh, from the system. So regarding the connection of the slabs, the, the, the they were coming just to the inner box, and in, I see. And in between the. Yeah, in between the two facades, we we had uh, connectors. Uh, yeah, we we didn't we didn't go deeper into it, but uh, um, I think um, yeah, this is what we 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 tried to do. Uh, we tried to to have uh, just a a system that uh, could be connecting these uh, two diagonal systems. Uh, we we didn't go too much in detail, uh, but we just uh, tried to. Analyze it uh, a little bit more in in 2D. Uh, okay, things. so yeah, the, this exploded axle helped maybe in terms of uh, you know strategy of your presentation. If that was in the beginning, then all the other 
information relating to individual components of your structure would be easier to uh, to to kind of locate. Um, but okay, I, I get it now. So you have basically these these internal cores, and then the inner uh, box that the slabs are connected to, and then the outer box is actually completely independent. Um, yeah. So so maybe you know by so so maybe by by finding synergies between between your your structural uh, elements, it can be uh, th th there is some optimization or like some cleanup to, to, to be done that might yield some, you know, some, uh, mm, you know, some, some interesting things where you actually look at how the things work together and a, a bit less uh, in isolation. Um, okay, then um, the next one, uh, again, yeah, also I was a bit overwhelmed with the density, sheer density of the, of the presentation. Um, um, on the one hand, extremely impressive. On the other hand, like a, a, a bit, you know, difficult to 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 digest in in this short amount of time. Um, what I really liked was that, yeah, here it was pretty clear the uh, how the let's say the the entire structure works uh, together, and also and also you made no difference between let's say structural questions questions and and architectural questions. Uh, so, so this I really appreciate uh, about this project that that every you know every uh, central core that you have is not just a structural element because yeah we just need to have a core there, but it's also like an atrium or a, um, how you say it um, a light well um, or a, a staircase. So so. The, the kind of the integrated uh, thinking of, of the project. I, I, I really liked, um, uh, yeah. And then for the last one, uh, the, the modularity of it, I, I, I was not sure in the end, like what it's for. So is it to have, uh, you know, a construction system that can be reconfigured? Uh, is, it, is it just, um, is it just a, let's say a static? Um, I mean, in, in terms of what's your own goal, you, you just wanted this kind of Tetris uh, look. I didn't mention that. Uh, I, I can respond on that. We wanted to have uh, gradual development, so people would actually um, order online their apartments, and the modules will get on site as people buy the apartments. Okay, understand. Well, um, so in the, in this sense, you kind of have a, a, a trade-off between this flexibility and the modularity, uh, because you know when you stack basically like shipping containers, then you can only add to the top, um, and and uh, and uh, if you would have let's say like a you know, a, a structure that connects everything that is independent of your modules, you can like more of a plug-in system, you might have more flexibility, um, you know, afterwards, because basically now when you, when what, whatever you put at the bottom kind of is fixed and you cannot take it out anymore because structurally everything that is on top uh, depends on it. Um, but this is more like what, what you really want to do with your modularity. So. Uh, and, and in in the in line with this, like the the criteria, uh, like the modularity during construction, where you have every unit like really uh, has its own structure, and you can lift it and place it there like a shipping container. When you have the entire structure assembled, you might have a lot of redundancies because every every module has to be rigid and 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 properly load bearing. In itself, um, and and then obviously when you you know when you put two shipping containers one next to one another, the the let's say the frames you you have kind of double the the uh, the, the cross section on the edge which maybe you you don't need. Uh, so so there's kind of a trade off you know of this modularity during construction and then and then what you would want uh, for the entire structure once it, it's put together. That's it. 
Great. And Nina, do you want to say something as well? Yes. Um, thank you for joining. This is the first time I've ever seen architecture students presenting structure in such a depth and such. So I think I'm just, no, but it's, it is really unique. And I think this is the moment that I'm going to make more make a general comment, I think. You know, you have this unique skill and I don't think other architect students, other architects will be able to produce this type of work and present it so well. So I think this is also, you've got very strong concepts with this box in box, whether it's um, this very organic shape, um, with a modular system. So I think you're in a unique position to almost go back and be the engineer and the architect and much more powerful than just being the architect or the engineer, you've got both, right? So it's you can go back and what is the box in box? How can you make your box in box concept even stronger? So it might be that your inner shell, your inner facade could be even more open, right? You, you spoke about optimization and utilization and 20%, 30% itches. And maybe you wanna make the members more slender, but you can also think about taking members out um, opening up the grid. So now you can be an architect that is so informed and I think just taking a step back and doing, maybe asking yourself three questions, what could be a better shape, a better orientation, a better floor plan, a better, so um, you're now the master of the structure. So it's no longer that you just have to make the connections or the members thinner, could be, that might be the architecture that you want. But I think, um, and the same with the modular, you know, you're stacking, you're talking about organically growing and maybe kind of a self-build. So what would be, what would empower a modular self-build? Um, and how can you now make the structure do that? So is it that your structure actually also becomes your working platform? Um, your structure is also, um, you know, it's always going to be the roof of somebody's house is always going to be the, 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 the floor of the next one and how do you, can you interconnect and how do you want to make openings can you make maybe if you work with the utilization of 60 70 percent that allows always to be material cut afterwards and to make these adaptations so i would just a more general comment i think you've got a unique skill you've got tons of work you've got so much data and it's just taking that step back and being um yeah being in control doing even better architecture because you now know right making a stronger concept that would be that would be it for me i think really but amazing oh, i so honestly nice i've never that. seen it i've <laughs> never seen it no i've never seen architects presenting this you know and so convincing and so structured and so structures accuse the fun but i mean you know to go through all those different steps the elements all the different load cases all the different gravity stability shear um connections it's it's stunning stunning okay that's it for me yay here here you know as they say in the uk uh anna do you want to say something as well to the students before i wrap this up uh yeah just once again i'm very very happy with all of your work it's really amazing and yeah we've had a lot of interesting discussions in support hours and i see that you've put a lot of work in in the last couple of like just in the last week i see so much improvement so good work <laughs> Yeah, really amazing. And also, Hannah, well, I'm sure all the guys wouldn't be able to have done it without you. So thank you so much uh, as well for it, uh, for your expertise and also kind of patience. And like really also, I think it's really great that there was this kind of extra opportunity to, to have some feedback uh, in between. And uh, I really love what uh, what Nina said, and I think indeed, like maybe the best thing to to kind of see this class is like, yeah, thinking about it as a kind of new skill. And I hope I taught you to be critical um, and critical to your own work, but also critical to to now kind of also see maybe how kind of engineers think and like what what is their kind of uh, ration and how can you actually propose alternatives, right? So I think this is really great because, yeah, there's no real success in just saying, okay, yeah, this works. Okay, great. But 
the the finesse really really comes from understanding how you can um yeah take a take this uh, this approach and uh, also i mean it was the first class i ever did kind of online so like or totally uh, online and deliberately uh, totally online um, and I think that, um, yeah, hopefully it worked really, it worked really well. And obviously time is always so short, uh, but I think that also kind of working every week uh, with the kind of small exercises and putting so much hard work into it, because I know it is not easy. And I also know it is not easy, all the questions that we are asking you and, um, you know, trying to reflect on everything that you do is really tough. So I want to, um, yeah, to say that's really, yeah, really amazing. Oh no, get me also emotional and everything. Ha, so strange. Um, so yeah, uh, I will come to uh, Barcelona, hopefully next year, you know, you never know. And as you guys said, we should all you know, try to come or try to meet at one point. I think it would be nice. And also, you know, maybe next week or just in the beginning of January or something, you know, when we are all a bit rested, we can have a lunch, drink, breakfast kind of gathering with all of us, let's say, again, still in all different time zones. But I think it would be nice, uh, yeah, to say, to say hi again uh, after. So really well done and good luck with the rest of the week do you still have also more uh, discussions tomorrow or only on friday friday only only yes. friday so now yeah, sleep friday. you know 24 hours <laughs> just go to go to rest i wish <laughs> <laughs> yeah so no really it is really it is really really great and also i'm really happy that we had the opportunity to also have engineers in this discussion right because i think it's really great because then we can see um yeah also like the the yeah the really kind of deep work that it is that you have created so you should all feel very proud i feel very proud for you so that's it great Okay. okay. Thank, thank you Take so up. much, Mane, and thanks all the all the Jerry for joining, and yeah. um, uh, as well thanks to the students for doing such an amazing work. Mm. Um, we students, we have one more presentation on Friday, and oh. then you can say that you <laughs> finished the first module of the MAKAD successfully, which is a big a big success for to finish the year with. <laughs> Yeah, Thanks for the invitation, Manja. Uh, it was very, very enjoyable, uh, very stimulating as always. And uh, yeah, good luck with the rest of the of the MA Cup. And I will have to leave now. So um, have a great day, and we speak very soon. Yes. Thanks Thank everyone you. for joining. Thank you. Also, Thank you. and Thank sorry, Thank Thank you. I didn't give Thank you the break. But Thank yeah, you. now we can all have a pee break and have a coffee and everything. <laughs> Bye. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.